Current former snipers of Reddit, what do movies misrepresent about sniping? Being a sniper essentially boils down to your being incredibly uncomfortable at all times. You should learn to love being cold, wet, and generally having an overall terrible quality of life while you're operating. Firstly, physically getting to the objective is absolutely brutal, and is probably the worst part of the job. Often you'll be laden down with like 200 plus pounds of gear and specialized equipment, including water food, ammunition, weapons, and radios batteries, which you'll have to carry silently through the night for several miles in the worst terrain you can find before you ever even get to the office to work. Once you spend however many hours days suffering while getting there, you'll have to set up a hide site for your team. There are a ton of variations on splitting up hide sites different hide styles that you may feel compelled to use depending on the situation. You'll probably want to get your hide build and load it before the sun comes up, or you're going to have a bad time. Most media portrays snipers as working alone or in pairs, at most, but real world sniper teams are usually 6-8 guys switching out team roles for the duration of the mission. Certain aspects of team composition equipment will vary from branch to branch and between units, but most teams should include a team leader, assistant team leader, machine gunner, radio operator, a corpsman medic, a slackman flex spot, unless your team leader is trash and doesn't train his guys. Everyone in the team should confidently be able to take over anyone's job at any point and continue operating. Everyone should also know how to use every weapon in the team, regardless of their own assigned billet. Other shooters spotters can be added if you need more bodies, but the general goal is to maintain a smaller footprint as possible out in the landscape. Often, it would be at the team leader's discretion how he wished to distribute his team and their loadouts. Obviously the situation will dictate this to a degree, as well and you may swap out weapons equipment depending on what you expect to encounter in gauge. Most media also tends to leave out how meticulous snipers are when they clean up leave their hide sites. An enormous amount of effort is put into not leaving behind target indicators that could possibly get your teammates killed or injured, or potentially poison the well for operating in that area in the future. Nobody will ever know a decent sniper team was operating in the area if they do everything right. Source USMC 0311, 0317, 2010 to 2015. The boredom. It's a little like golf. Lots of practice and repetition. On the other hand, you get really good at estimating wind speed, distance, and elevation. Having a good spotter kills time. Lots of Archer and Super Troopers references. Lots of movie quotes. I bet the Archer quote is always big whoop. I'm spooning a bar at 50 calories. I could kill a building. Not a qualified sniper but former marine grunt. Star. Surveillance and target acquisition. Platoon is not nearly as glorious as people think it is. Actually shooting targets is a fairly small part of their overall skill set. Their primary mission is reckon and observation. The reality of sniping is less waiting around to shoot an HVT. The reality is usually you snoop your way into an observation post under cover of darkness. Build a hide that you must remain almost completely still in 99% of the time. Crapping and pee in plastic bags and making sure you leave no trash behind to give the enemy any idea you were ever there. Then after a few days of this crap existence, you quietly and sneakily break down your hide to snoop your way back out. Now that being said I knew a few dudes when I was in, and there are well known stories about snipers stacking some serious bodies, but those guys are generally the exception not the rule. This guy gets it. 8541. 3 stroke 5 star. Just about every movie, save a few. What people don't realize is there is math involved at long distances. Having to calculate between distance, wind, velocity of the round, movement of the target. I am not a sniper, but I was a rifleman. Example of a range calculation. Target range equals target height in meters x 1000 size of object in mildits on the scope. Say an average male, 1.7 m, appears to be 2 mildits high in the reticle. He is 850 meters away. Then there's bullet drop compensation. Bullets travel in an arc. Typically at ranges past 350 meters you want to aim higher than the target. Once knowing the range, you generally refer to a pre-registered chart for that weapon system. We cannot forget angle compensation for shooting at targets up and or down a hill. And in rare situations air density, pressure, 
and temperature can affect the path and range of a round. Source, 0311 Rifleman. According to Eric Haney, Sniper and Delta Force, one of two things can psychologically happen to a sniper. 1. You become emotionally attached to your target after watching them for hours and can't pull the trigger when the time comes. 2. The power of watching a person dissolve into a cloud of red mist makes you feel powerful, and you want to go on a shooting spree. His book is one heck of a read. Usually in fiction the sniper is either alone or is with a spotter that is less experienced. In reality the spotter is usually the more experienced in team. The spotter chooses the target and does calculations to account for distance, atmospheric conditions, etc. Does all the work someone else gets the credit. JK. Teamwork makes the dream work. I'm not a sniper but I am a long range shooter. When you're running big calibers and you send a round the recoil is going make you lose the view in the scope. Rarely are you gonna watch the round impact through the scope. Don't have an exact quote but it's from Howard Wasden in his book. Talking about being a sniper in Somalia. He was protecting some helicopters coming and grabbing suspects. And saw someone come around a building with an RPG. And ended up putting a round in the guy's face he made it a point to say that in movies the bullets always knock him over. But in real life the bullet sucks them in. Also back at base when everyone was congratulating him on protecting M and getting a headshot, he made sure not to tell them that he wasn't aiming for his head. You should have gone for the head launches RPG. It takes a great deal more patience. A couple minutes of spotting target in film is almost always a couple hours I roll. You have to nearly meditate, but be ready to act at a moment's notice. Excitement is the enemy. I see calm rules the day. You can do everything right and still miss, especially at a great distance or when wind is active, doubly so if both are factors. Spotters are a part of it, whereas in film the lone wolf is the frequently communicated image. Even if you are content to do the job, erasing life can wear on you, because rarely if ever in modern day are you fighting a war that involves your nation's very survival, as was the case in past wars. Now you're just punching tickets in most cases. Unless you lack humanity, it's not enjoyable. You don't pull triggers, you squeeze them. It's boring, punctuated by brief time passage so intense it feels like you age years. Whoa. Best wishes to you. I can't speak from personal experience but my friend was a sniper in the Canadian army. According to him it requires a lot of math. So much so that many snipers carry a pen and notepad with them a lot. Less pen and not a pad and more schematics and tables tbh. Wait a second. This is being asked on the 55th anniversary of the JFK assassination. Is someone trying to flush out the grassy knoll guy? Dang it he's onto us. Not a sniper or military member, but I don't think they ever show the actors wearing diapers because they can't get up to take a pee when sneaking along in gilly. Snipers almost never see any action. They mostly wait around, even in active war zones. The movies make it look like non-stop action, but they mostly just sit and wait and smoke and eat chow and wait and wait more. Typical military hurry up and wait. My dad used to be a sniper, and he told me when spotters say two clicks to the movies tend to actually calibrate the scope where it clicks twice, but that would mean they've gone too far that direction. Nice tip. I was never a sniper but worked with them a lot. This is from an American perspective in the war on terror. Everyone seems to focus on the modern sniper as this precision shot guy, and there is that aspect to them. But to me, working with them, it seemed like much 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 more of their time and energy was spent on a reconnaissance role. Especially with the proliferation of IEDs in this war. Basically, have a sniper team or squad set up an observation point on a ridge somewhere. Watching over a particular stretch of road where IEDs have been common or you have intel one might be laid. Sniper team scouts that stretch of road from their OP and maybe they see the team go to place the IED. Then they can call RT in on that position. And you can apply to this to other actions. Scouting an area where insurgents frequently set up ambushes. See if you catch them while setting up. Providing overwatch for an infantry platoon as it patrols an opposing ridgeline or village. VTC etc. I have never heard any other soldiers say this. But one of our reckon platoons and cos once mentioned a saying that a sniper's most powerful weapon is his radio. IDK if that is actually a common saying within the scout sniper community or not lol. 
but in my observational experience it really rung true. Long range shooter and varmint hunter from way back in the day, the depiction of snipers yanking the trigger, their body movement, the gun twisting jumping is wholly not the type of real movements for a perfected shot, the gun must move from its recoil, perhaps back and up a little bit, but any other movements are just baloney, and would cause a miss for a shot fired at any longer distant target. Yes I've made the mistake of moving too much on a trigger pull. I would recommend Marine Sniper, 93 confirmed kills, a book about Carlos Hathcock, very interesting and dark in some places but that's the way it is. Also are you looking for anything in particular or just movies that frick crap up? Just misrepresentations. Sort of relevant, heard from one of my recruit trainers that if you hear a gunshot from long range, you shouldn't panic, the sniper already missed, because the bullet travels faster than sound. The first thing you hear is the impact of the round striking something, then the gunshot. My sniper section leader loved to say snipers wear diapers. While I wasn't exactly busting out the huggies, thank frick I never needed to. Just remember, everybody poops. Enjoy that 2 week SKT, small kill team, suckers. Also, any of those stupid butt stories about snipers seeing tears in the eyes of victims from 1000 yards away right before they start landing headshots against ISIS Taliban whatever we're fighting are super bulls. Your scope isn't that nice. Retired SWAT sniper here. Just a few off the top of my head. The spot with the best view is always on top of or very near. An ant bed. If the ants have the day off, expect mosquitoes, biting flies, etc. You're there for hours or days, hot or cold. Sometimes you have to get up and move quickly after laying up for a very long time. And you're sore as heck and legs are probably sleep. You might fall back down and look like a dumb ass. Movies games ignore bathroom issues. Your ghillie suit stinks and is full of burrs. Roaming dogs give your spot away. Inevitably, your hide requires crawling a long way on your belly. Not hands and knees, but flat out, pulling with fingers and toes. Dirt. Dirt is everywhere. It's hard to hide and keep your bullet path free of foliage obstruction all at the same time. You carry a lot of crap, and you have to collect all of it when you move. Don't run out of anything like water or radio batteries, because resupply will give you away. In some deserts, you'll encounter walking cactus. It sucks. If you have allergies, you'll be crawling 400 yards through whatever's pollinating at the time. Oh, and what everyone else said about wind. Temperature, humidity, vertical angles, and zero. Anecdote but my grandma's brother was special forces back home. He said his favorite was sniper training. He mentioned that being a sniper takes a certain kind of individual. I know he's seen combat but he's never told me much. My buddy was spec ops in the army. Said he passed on sniper school because it seemed too personal. His explanation was in a firefight. You're spray and pray at someone spraying and praying at you. A sniper though, you're looking at your target, you see their face and you kill them. That's got away on you after a while. I'm not and I have never been a sniper but my grandfather was in Korea. He watched a guy for a week and learnt his habits etc. He knew that the guy was going down to the river to pray and plan to kill him. But on the day he began thinking of all the things he was going to take away from him and the people he would be leaving behind. On that day he didn't pull the trigger, but the next day he came down to the river to pray and didn't leave the riverbed alive. According to a family friend who's been a SEAL sniper since 2003, when you hit someone with a larger caliber .50.338, you look for the spray mist of blood that comes up. Everyone is right about the math in earlier comments. Ammunition being selected, sometimes even hand loaded, the spin of the earth, the waiting and waiting and waiting. The movies don't show the tension, the thrill, or the light intakes of breath while watching your target and waiting till exactly the right moment to press the trigger and buy that item on eBay with one second remaining. One thing I enjoyed about long gun work is training as a spotter to see trace, or the ripples in the air from the bullet path. It's pretty important for coaching your shooter and identifying where the bullet went. I don't recall seeing any accurate depiction of that in film, other than in the Matrix, and only for dramatic effect. I'm by no means an expert on sniping, I trained in it for a time and enjoyed it, 
Had a lot of respect for the repetition and discipline it took to get good. There's a lot of pride when you hit a small target at long range, using a precise weapon. A film tends to underestimate the time investment and discipline required to get good at a skill like that. Not anything remotely close to a sniper, but I shot a long gun once. The biggest lesson for me was that unlike in Hollywood, you shouldn't put your eye so close to the scope. Rather, it's always a few inches away. I'm so glad I wore glasses or have some sort of eye protection or else I'd be blind in one eye. Scope bite. The best way to snipe is not to spend countless hours sitting still and silent waiting for the perfect shot. The best way to snipe is to jump off buildings doing a 360 motion while quick scoping offensively. Spoken like true champion. To those current former snipers, is the movie trope that you have to have your mouth open when firing a really powerful rifle realistic? The rationale given is that keeping the mouth allows the pressure in your ears to equalize with the pressure outside when the rifle is fired. Most guys in the community are not what you might expect. Extreme patience and intelligence are key aspects to the job so the guys who are good at it are usually quiet thinking types with extreme levels of will and determination. Not to be confused as beta by any means but not brute force types either. A lot of my old buddies are just physically fit nerds really. I can't count the number of hours spent talking about World of Warcraft while waiting to infill or during training heights. One thing film does get correct is how close the teammates are. It's definitely a family. The decision to ask my now wife to marry me was made in a hide site with my spotter. Training is fun, but dope collection is pretty dang boring. Hours and hours through days, weeks and months during all types of weather and lighting just shooting rounds at different distances to see the way the ammo and weapon performs for future reference and meticulously recording information. The math involved is not as difficult as it's made out to be and is often repetitious. You don't have to be a perfect shooter, just perfectly consistent when inputting data, acquiring holding side picture, squeezing trigger and follow through. Consistency equals accuracy, but a consistent shooter with textbook form is even more deadly. Source 13 years and counting. Fun fact. Every one of those memory games and what is different between these two pictures is a gauge of how good of a sniper you'll make. Dang I missed my calling. My stepdad is a former sniper who spent several years deployed. I asked him for his answer and he said the biggest thing they don't show correctly is the physical stress. In movies, the guy just shows up, sets up, takes the shot and leaves. He said they don't show how they have to sit there, completely still, for hours on end. An example he gave was one time having to wait 7.5 hours in position, and then getting told to stand down. My stepdad did never miss a shot in the field. He did get seen once, though, and have to bail out with his spotter very quickly. My old roommate was a special forces sniper. He told me a few things. 1. Training for control is incredibly tedious and takes a very long time. For example, pulling the trigger causes the rifle to shake a little bit. So they required him to initially put a small dowel rod in the barrel with a quarter balanced on the end and pull the trigger 100 times without letting the quarter fall off. They made this progressively harder by increasing the length of the dowel rod and by decreasing the size of the coin to a dime. 2. The army purposefully selects people with sociopathic tendencies for high stress positions like being a sniper so that they don't hesitate on ethically questionable situations. It's dark, but it's a necessary evil. It takes way more effort to cop all the hippie beast brands. You need to snipe the drops or they'll sell out in seconds. Not to mention the crazy bots people use. The world is against you. Math math and more math. You don't just point and shoot there are enough calculations and variables going on to make Bill Nye vomit. Good friend of mine was a SWAT sniper. It was mostly racing into a tactical position then just having a nice view of some idiot eventually surrendering. Only a few good sniper movies out there, so how would enemy at the gates rate on realism? Shooting itself gets boring after a while. Only so many watermelons and TVs you can make go boom before you start looking for goofy stuff to go boom. They leave out the part about how you can trade pictures with your rifle for just about anything. I once had a cook offer me a box of ice cream to let him take pictures with my M24 to send home. It was delicious. Those who have left the theater mid-show, what were you watching and what made you leave? 
A girl I was seeing insisted that if we brought her 2 year old with us to the movies he'd be quiet and probably fall asleep. I was so embarrassed about how poorly he was acting I took him out of the theater about 5 minutes in. It was some movie about bank robbers or something. She and her friend stayed for the rest of the movie. She wasn't a very good girlfriend. Dude frick that. I walked out of Battlefield Earth just after they taught themselves how to fly Harrier jets. It was being shown in a movie theater on a navy base so it was free. Hey this is my one and only walkout too. It was just so bad. Even to 13 year old kids. I saw Dunkirk the third day it was in theaters. I knew not a lot of people were interested, but when me and my buddy got there it was totally empty. The movie is almost started and a flood of middle schoolers come in, no parents or chaperones. I kid you not like 30-40 of them. We got 10 minutes in and demanded a refund because we couldn't watch the movie. These kids were ridiculous and they sent an usher in and some of them were asked to leave because they were throwing stuff. We got our money back and a pair of free tickets for a later showing. Sounds like a history teacher trying to be cool and telling his class to go see it. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. I was too scared. We left and walked into the sandlot. I was like 7 and don't know why I was scared. Because that movie is genuinely horrifying. Boss baby. I was the only one in that theater and there was a fire alarm. It was a false alarm. They said they'd reset all the movies but didn't reset mine. As a non-confrontational person, I just left. This is the saddest thing I've ever heard. I was a little kid when Chicken Run came out. My family raised chickens as pets and we thought it would be a cute Sean the Sheep type of film due to the claymation. As soon as that crazy bee baked a chicken into a pie, I was sobbing and my dad rushed me out of the theater. Chickens go in, pies come out. Oh what kind? Apple. Oh my favorite. Incredibles 2. The kid next to me was non-stop talking throughout the movie and the parents did nothing to stop it. I finally lost it when someone's baby had been screaming for 5 minutes straight and they never left the theater. I walked out of Incredibles 2 because my 3 year old daughter started getting restless and instead of subjecting the entire theater to her crying I left. I tried to go see Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone with my grandma when I was younger, but we walked into not another teen movie. The opening scene is the main girl masturbating, so we ducked out real quick. My mom took me to see NATM when it came out because I asked. I was 10. I witness this today. I went to go see Holmes and Watson. During the scene when they are essentially talking about drunk texts and dong pics the family to left of us walked out. Five minutes later the family to right of us walked out as well. Went from being super crowded row to us having the back row to ourselves. Was pretty nice. LOL. Long long ago. Far far away. A group of us in college went to an avant-garde art film near campus. That art film turned out to be Solo. 120 Days of Sodom. By Pierce Orlo Pasolini. This group of young. Hip, experiential college students didn't last very long in that flick before bailing. It's easy to google, I'd feel funny describing it. I've never walked out of a movie, but I was close with the passion of the Christ. It wasn't the movie itself, just the fact that a church group sitting behind me had brought their toddlers along. Some guy is getting tortured to death on screen, and there are kids behind me talking about going to Chuck E. Cheese afterward. The cognitive dissonance was agonizing. Interesting. To this day I tell people that the worst movie experience of my life was in the theater watching Passion of the Christ. Cell phones ringing. Kids running up and down the aisle. Baby crying. Adults talking at a regular volume. I already knew how the movie ended so wasn't too bothered. But still. Percy Jackson and the Olympians. The Lightning Thief. I was so mad that it was absolutely nothing like the books. They completely changed the entire plot. For my 11th birthday I brought all of my friends to see the lightning thief in theaters and left the movie devastated. There's a lightning thief musical now that's extremely faithful to the book and is packed with references. It's geared towards kids, but the soundtrack is worth checking out on Spotify. As a bunch of 20 plus geekish Star Trek Babylon 5 fans we were going to watch Galaxy Quest. Halfway one of my friends walks out because he was so insulted how it portrayed his Star Trek experience. That made us double as good as the movie already was. 
I still freaking love GQ to this day, probably watch it once or twice a year. Movie 43. I went with my cousin who really thought it would be great. I made it part way through the Hugh Jackman skit before I just had to leave. My cousin was laughing his head off so he stayed. I went to the entrance to play on my phone. When I ran into a few of my students and their parents who invited me to go to the arcade with them. So like any good 4th grade teacher, I destroyed them in air hockey and basketball free throw. Besides being a good way to kill some time, I got a lot of respect from the parents for not just ignoring their kids. You'll be happy to know it won a golden raspberry for worst film. I walked out of Sky High. I was having a kidney stone attack and rolling around on the floor of a theater seemed impolite. I like Sky High but kidney stones are the worst. I sympathize and I hope you haven't had any reoccurrences. Keep drinking that water. The remake of The Hills Have Eyes. They have a scene where the father was crucified and set on fire. Lots of screaming. At the same time some girl is being raped in their RV so she's screaming too. The sound system was so loud and seeing that did something to me. Usually I'm good with horror and such but my heart was beating out of control. I never felt anything like it. I whispered to my friend that I had to leave and spent an hour in a comic shop nearby just cooling down from the whole thing. I have to turn the movie off or skip that scene every time. It's rough. Deadpool 2. I was so freaking depressed that I couldn't follow what was happening at all. I left feeling so defeated. Happily, I just watched it a week ago, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Glad you ended up enjoying yourself. Not quite like the other answers, but still fits. Was watching the musical Dear Evan Hansen, and at the intermission, I got up and left not knowing that it wasn't over yet. I felt really weird about it because it was sudden and there was no bowing or wrap up or anything, but I still walked out, got a cab back to my hotel, and only right as soon as I got out of the cab, I looked up the soundtrack to make sure I didn't miss half the show, realized I totally did, then spent a bunch of time trying to get another cab. LOL my brother watched The Martian and thought it was over at one point, haven't seen the movie so I don't know, and left, yeah he never got back to earth. Later I read that he did, indeed make it back to earth. Myself and a couple of my friends bought tickets to see Disney monkeys, and snuck into the Get Hard Theater, rated R. Security caught us and kicked us out, we asked if we could go back to Disney monkeys, they said either we could leave or watch Paul Blart Mall Cop 2, we left. This is amazing if it's true and that security guard is a gem. I went to see Inspector Gadget when I was a kid and they kept screwing up the film reel and had to restart it three times. Then the movie theater caught fire and we had to leave. I never ended up seeing it lol. It was a sign from God. The new Holmes movie with Will Ferrell. I'm actually sitting outside right now waiting for the rest of my party to go finish it. It is an absolute piece of garbage that no one should go see. The best way to describe how it fails is it's the kind of movie where all the bits are something that might sound mildly interesting as a premises, but they're unoriginal and just, meh. It really is quite insulting and I adore the majority of Will Ferrell's other films. In other words one must be inebriated to find its merit. I take this into consideration when viewing a wide range of films because sometimes you just won't have the heart to subscribe to the writing. Hardcore Henry, only thing in history to make me motion sick. Puked twice on the, carpeted, floor before I made it to the bathroom. Then once in the bathroom and then once in the parking lot for good measure. Had to call my mom to get me cause I didn't want to puke while driving home. Lasted less than 30 minutes. That's a shame. I really liked Hardcore Henry. It's an insanely over the top adrenaline rush. Would have done it with Percy Jackson. Sea of monsters if I weren't on the younger side and afraid of being kidnapped. And as someone who read the books and was literally writing my own fanfic at the time, the movie was 100% unacceptable. It was so wrong in so many ways and broke my poor little demigod heart and nearly ruined the entire series for me. I feel your pain in a way I can't explain. The 2017 movie Kidnap with Halle Barry. I had to leave because this lady had so many chances to save her kid within the first 20 minutes of him being taken. It got to the point where I'm asking myself if she really does want her kid back. This is one of my top bad movies. 
My fave was the constant cutter stock footage of the MPH needle going from 40 to 60, like, it didn't matter where she was, could be a freeway or a back road, every time she accelerated she went 40 to 60. I left a high school performance of Mary Poppins at intermission because the sound was very bad, I couldn't understand the dialogue, from what I could tell, the leading lady was a talented singer but otherwise, terrible show, and I live for high school musicals. Wildcats, everywhere, throw your hands up in the air. Suicide Squad was the only one I wish I had. I stuck it out in some vain hope it would somehow redeem itself but it was just so comically and terribly bad. Some of the character intros when taken as a separate thing, not bad. Movie, terrible. When will all the attempts to recreate the Avengers stop skipping the individual backstory films already? As an Australian, watching any scene with Captain Boomerang made me cringe so freaking hard. Went to see Phantom of the Opera 2, Electroc Boogaloo, I'm pretty sure that's not the real title but that's what I called it, I had never seen the first but it's my girlfriend's favorite musical so I went with her, I fell asleep during the first act but when I woke up she was so sad because she hated the music and apparently they fricked up the story hard, I offered to take her for ice cream instead of watching the second act and she jumped at the opportunity. This is great, there is a movie called Boogie Nights 2. Electric Boogaloo. My father-in-law got really excited one day that it was on and the second they started singing he goes yeah that's enough of that, and changed it. Poseidon, my friends and I took some acid and decided to see a movie. If you haven't seen it, Poseidon is a remake of the Poseidon Adventure, wherein a cruise ship gets flipped upside down by a rock wave and a group of people have to try to escape the upside down death ship before it sinks too far underwater. It was super traumatizing to our drug addled selves and we had to nope out of there and go find a playground to chill out. Kurt Russell is good in it, but he's good in everything. Spider-Man 3. There was a medical emergency while watching and immediately had to leave. Went back about a week later. Get to roughly the same part. Get called on another medical emergency. Said frick it. Ended up just waiting it out and bought it on DVD. My first mistake was finishing that movie. A third medical emergency would have been less painful. The Predator movie that just came out. I think it was when Olivia Munn's character said something along the lines of Some scientists think that autism is the next step of human evolution. That, and, with global warming, how much time do humans have left 2-3 years, maybe less? I liked it. Also, he said 2-3 generations, not years. Two times, one not me. Q was just over the top gore violence, thought I was having a heart attack. South Park movie. There were at least three different signs saying, not family friendly, parents had a toddler who they physically lifted out of there, one arm each, during the first musical number, with the opening line, shut your f face, uncle f. Edinburgh Fringe Show, and the dude literally insulted half the audience based on very tense politics, half the room left, I was with that half, it was damning too, small venue and we were literally 5 feet from the performer college production of Pirates of Penzance, sitting in the second row, and the actor's projection and diction was so bad I could not understand them, and I know every word, stayed till intermission and did not return. Not me, but what I witnessed, me and my friend went to go watch IT when it came in theaters and halfway through when the kids are in Pennywise's lair, some lady in front of us stands up and yells out nope and continues for a good minute or two while her boyfriend was trying to calm her down. Eventually she gets up and says I can't take this anymore and leaves. Some people in the theater start to clap as she leaves and her boyfriend just awkwardly chases after her. Wasn't me but the only time I ever saw someone walk out of a theater was watching the movie Mother with Jennifer Lawrence. Spoilers if you haven't seen it. The movie is very strange throughout but the intense ending where the newborn baby is getting eaten was when the first couple in the theater walked out. The second was when Jennifer Lawrence was getting stomped on the ground that two more couples left. That was a super intense scene. I wonder how many worldwide walked out at that point. It was a performance of Shen Yun. Art that connects heaven and earth. You've probably seen ads for it around town and on YouTube. 
my wife and I though it was going to be some cool Chinese acrobatics and traditional dance. We made a date night out of it and everything. Dressed up real nice. Shelled out for $80 tickets. Drove downtown. Not only was the actual performance of incredibly mediocre quality, it also turned out to be propaganda for some kooky Chinese cult called Falun Gong. We got through such memorable skits as, Wise Sensei Cures Gayness, Dutiful Husband and Leader Abandons Everyone to Paint Buddha Statues After One Heck of an Acid Trip, Totally Not Communists Kill Everyone, Then Mushroom Clouds, Then Everyone Is Alive Again Because Jesus Faith or Something, It Was a Freaking Train Wreck. I kinda wanted to ride the rainbow to the crazy center, but my wife got super unconformable and we left. We ended up eating tapas, doing shots and bashing the thing for the rest of the night. What a trip. Star Trek V, the one Shatner directed. I got up and left when they showed Uhuru dancing. It was pretty obviously not Uhuru below the neck. I mean I got nothing against Uhuru. It was just an ugly, awful, poorly done scene. By far the most awful of the Star Trek movies. I watched this on video when it came out and it was just awful. Kurt blowing up God with a photon torpedo was plain weird. I walked out of Batman vs Superman when Batman branded people which somehow convinced prisoners to murder them. It was difficult to walk out though because I was watching it at home. Little Shop of Horrors. If you don't know, Little Shop is about a giant man-eating plant. My dad took sissy 11 year old me home at intermission because of the voice of the plant really freaked me out. But this was a high school production. And when I joined this theater program in 9th grade, I found out that the plant had been voiced by a freshman at the time. Feed me. See more. Feed me. There was a show in London that the school I was with took us to. Our artistic director really hyped it up. The show was based in America where we were all from and basically tried to combat every type of violence in the country using real life examples. Sandy Hook, a Texas prison riot, the Brown Campus sexual assault case. It was too close to home for a lot of us, and the jokes in the show that the audience were laughing at just weren't funny to any of us in the program. Basically what made me leave was they didn't disclose that there would be live gunshots on stage, and I was dealing with a close friend's recent suicide. And one character out a gun under his chin and pulled the trigger. I basically freaked out and had to walk back to our hostel. Plus, the accents were awful. Oof that sounds horrible. Happy Feet. My girlfriend, at the time, and I were the only ones in the theater. So we were making out. She got on top of me. And we were asked to leave. There were like 5 employees watching us. So they watched you make out. Alice in Wonderland. 2010. My girlfriend at the time and I snuck in a bottle of whiskey when we went to see it and ended up bored and drunk so we decided to leave. Justice League. What made me love was another patron sitting behind us that kept making an annoying noise. I dk if it was a tick or what, but this dude kept making that ksh noise like a soda dispenser makes after dispensing soda. I have misophonia. So I was irate with the guy. The theater gave us two sets of complimentary tickets because of it. I had only asked to come back at a different time. But the girl working at customer service went above and beyond. Which was nice. Not a movie but we got given tickets to see Shen Yun performing arts. They bill themselves as one of the world's premier classical Chinese dance and music company. Yet, yeah, turns out they are a money making front for Falun Gong and push their propaganda during the show. We left at the break because, 1, we don't like being preached at, and, 2, only about 1 stroke 2 of what we saw was actually any good. I had my first ever case of vertigo while watching Mad Max, Fury Road. My friends and I had the unfortunate luck of walking into a full theater with the only seats available being in the very front row, right under the screen. The angle of looking up at the screen combined with the strobe light sandstorm scene you know, the one they warned everyone about before the movie even hit theaters, made me so nauseous I left the theater, threw up my cherry IC, and went back in to tell my friends I had to split. I still haven't finished that movie. Frick I'm getting old. I assumed theater here referred to live theater and got confused when people kept mentioning movie titles. It might be regional I'm young in the UK and nobody calls cinemas movie theaters. What is the dumbest plot hole you've seen in a story? Spoiler alert for high tension. 
Twist ending is that the hero and villain are the same person with multiple personalities. But the two were verifiably in separate places at the same time, even sometimes driving separate vehicles that actually both get to new locations. It's such a lazy attempt at a gotcha ending that the filmmakers didn't even bother to ensure the rest of the movie made the ending remotely possible. It's a shame, because it's a great thriller until the ending, so I assume it was tacked on during production. But the twist ruins repeat viewings because none of what's happening could literally be happening. Like in Fight Club, when they're smashing cars walking down the street, all of the ones Ed Norton hits has their car alarm go off but none of the ones Brad Pitt hit go off. Transformers, the Decepticons can hack into the US military servers, but can't work out how to simply place a bid on eBay for the glasses? Captchis, they work my dude. This is a cliche, but I believe we can't ignore Buzz Lightyear thinking he's not a toy but yet freezing every time humans enter the room. I'd like to think that Star Command trained Buzz to believe that humans are insanely strong. Giant aliens and your best survival tactic is to just freeze until they go away. I once read a really terrible book called Anna and the French Kiss because someone I looked up to said it was good. It was not. The main character was supposed to be a real film nerd but was surprised to find that they had cinemas in France. France. The place where many people say modern cinema was born. She's supposed to love film. She should know this. It would have taken the author two seconds to google. That and she didn't order food for a month or something because she thought the lunch ladies would only speak French despite going to a majority English speaking school. She was literally the dumbest protagonist I've ever seen. Plus she was kind of a bee butt. What with talking crap about the way that the one girl dressed. Hinting that she was S. When Anna's freaking butt was trying to bang the girl's boyfriend. JK Rowling said on Twitter that Harry Potter and the Cursed Child is canon. But there are way too many plot holes with time turners. Originally JK said that time turners only work for up to 5 hours. And that there can only be one timeline. And it can't change. Well... In CC that's obviously not the case. In The Walking Dead, they figured out in early on that they can smear dead people's guts all over them and the zombies can't smell them. Yet they never do this again, despite the fact that it would save their lives constantly. X-Men 3 P me off with one, out of universe story behind this. Filmmakers wanted to adapt the Phoenix Saga, XX wanted it to adapt the Cure arc, compromise was we'll just do both. And apparently nobody realized that since the cure arc is about a cure for mutant powers, and the phoenix saga is about a mutant who needs to die because she's too powerful for her own good or the good of the world, that they solve each other. Wolverine doesn't need to kill Jean Grey to resolve this plot, he just needs to knock her out so they can give her the cure. Nobody involved in the making of the film noticed that apparently. Ha. I never put two and two together. They did the same with Magneto in the very same film. It's odd the X-Men didn't consider doing it to Jean. The Dark Knight Rises. The entire sequence of Bruce going broke. Absolutely bulls that Bane could commit securities banking fraud by shooting up the stock exchange. Exactly zero transactions would be processed. And the whole nuclear bomb reactor thing. I can suspend disbelief for comic book movies but some things are patently ridiculous if you're shooting for realism. In the Santa Claus, the adults don't believe in Santa but he does exist, so who the frick do they think is leaving the presents in their houses every Christmas? It's like the Neuralizer in Men in Black except in reverse, the parents think they remember buying the presents, and the elves discreetly charge a gift fee from their bank account so it looks legit. Meanwhile the money goes into funding Santa's workshop. It takes a little more than Christmas cheer to pay the heating bill when you live at the North Pole. The hangover. They were in a casino hotel right? Every square inch of those buildings is monitored 24 stroke 7. There is no way in heck that guy would have been stuck on the roof for more than an hour before some security guards went to get him. 2 from Frozen. 1. A whole mob led by Hans goes to kill Elsa. Then when they catch her, and are ready for the kill, all of a sudden Hans says not to hurt her, with absolutely no reason for the flip. It's not like they went there and saw some sort of helpless, tragic creature who deserves pity. They found an ice witch who summoned a giant snow beast to kill the party, including her own sister. 2. Hans wants to take the throne. 
so he tries to leave Anna to die, but Anna was head over heels for him and they were going to be married. With Elsa gone, that would make them king and queen. Why try to kill her when you've pretty much got exactly what you want? I mean if you want to rule alone, at least wait until you're officially married to fake her death. Home Alone. Kevin orders a pizza yet the phone lines are supposed to be down which is why no family can call him. I've googled it and some people have different theories but I think they just slipped up lol. Final Destination 3. In the premonition, we see them ride the roller coaster and that one dude with a video camera drops his camera. It wraps round the track below them and when the train comes to this section of track, it hits the camera and derails, killing everyone. Protagonist loses her crap. Everyone gets booted off the train, including camera guy. A minute or so later, the other characters are all berating the protagonist for freaking out and getting them kicked off the ride. While this is happening, the roller coaster crashes in the background. Despite the camera guy cause of the crash being stood with them, holding his camera. I didn't expect a lot from a Final Destination movie, but at least the two before it were actually written by someone who cared a bit and were consistent bothered taking notes. The whole premise of Ant-Man. I love Ant-Man. I love the story. But by Pime's explanation, Ant-Man gets tiny BC the Pime particle just reduces the space between atoms. Sure, fine, that makes sense. But that just means his density increases. He's not light as an ant. You don't just lose mass. That means he shouldn't be able to ride an ant or run along a gun barrel or do those amazing leaps. And if he is as light as an ant and can do all those things, then I don't give a frick how hard he punches. It's not gonna hurt. Ants may be strong for their size but lem tell ya, if an ant punched me I wouldn't freaking feel it. The whole idea of Ant-Man makes no sense even in comic book logic. On the same token, G Ant-Man shouldn't get heavy enough to break an airplane. All they did was decrease his density. If anything, he might be able to walk like he's on the moon or something. The Truman Show. None of the kids back in elementary school would have told him that it's a TV show. Or did they all just believe it was real life, and then they were told after growing up that their childhood was a lie? I'm more surprised as to who would keep watching that show. I'd probably get bored of it after a month. Just a guy doing his everyday stuff. Venom. I refuse to believe evil Elon Musk doesn't have cameras in his facility, especially when we later discover his goon's body cameras. In Back to the Future, the DeLorean needs 1.21 gigawatts and to be moving at 88 miles per hour to travel through time. In the second movie, Doc is hovering in the air and gets struck by lightning and travels back to 1888. How did the DeLorean travel back in time if it wasn't traveling at 88 miles per hour? In Batman Begins there's a machine that instantly vaporizes all water in the vicinity, but somehow humans, that are 75% water, are unaffected. Also apparently Crane's drug was running through Gotham's water supply in preparation for all the water to be vaporized and the drug could go airborne. But if the drug was in the water, as soon as anyone in Gotham boiled water or took a shower they would have been affected by the drug. At the end of Until Dawn, Sam and Mike, I think those are their names, suddenly know that Wendigas only see movement, despite neither of them having been around to hear that be revealed. Chases a police puppin but he never arrests Mayor Humdinger for his endless crime spree. Humdinger even steals the poor patroller and still doesn't really face any consequences for it. This man is kids. The Flash Season 2. Oh zoom you are telling me you are dying so you need to steal Barry's speed to live. Wait a minute you kept Jay Garrick the Flash from Earth 3 prison but for some reason decided not to steal his speed to live. Jay Garrick wasn't as fast because he hadn't had enough pep talks to believe in himself. Ready Player One's first key being obtained by driving backwards. You're trying to make me believe that in the entire time that the challenge has been issued, not a single person in that game who did the race decided to screw around by driving backwards? Andy Bernard who had done nothing but be depicted as a hot-headed loser who couldn't even make a sale becomes regional manager. Thomas and Friends. 1. There are more engines than people. 2. The trains do whatever they want despite needing people to shovel coal and run them. How do the trains get lost if there are engineers on boat 3? Trains get sent to the smelter's yard when they aren't useful. 
All the diesels take trains they don't like there. So there's train murder. In Eagle Eye Powerful Omnipresent Eye orchestrates ridiculously complicated chain of events in order to kill US presidential cabinet, but isn't powerful enough to just kill them traditional way. Also, the entire attack hinged on a bomb going off on free in the line on the land of the free in the national anthem. If the bomb was detonated by the pitch, it would have exploded on the word red from and the rocket's red glare instead. Harry Potter. Wizards are completely oblivious to muggle tech. It's stupid. Most of the wizards in that world come from muggle families. They grew up with ballpoint pens, telephones, firearms, TV, etc etc. Yet they use something as stupid and inefficient as owls. They use something as stupid and inefficient as quills. They use something as stupid and inefficient as wands to kill each other. I know it's been repeated over and over again, but the whole thing is a bit silly. In The Walking Dead, none of the cars have dead batteries, flat tires or stale gasoline. None the of zombies rot and no one uses military equipment. The car thing bugs the frick out of me. I was under the assumption that gasoline went stale after about 6-ish months, but it's been 4 years or so. I guess diesel lasts longer, but the cars they drive around most of the time are not diesel. Even then, I don't know how much longer diesel lasts. I'm thinking 4 years is a stretch. The fundraiser and Dark Knight. Batman and Rachel fall out the window and then everything is just cool at his apartment. The Joker is still there with his goons looking for Harvey and now there's no Batman. But it's just totally never mentioned again and we are left with just having to assume that they just packed up and left without incident. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. There's literally a potion that students make that make people tell the truth but they couldn't prove Sirius was innocent. Also, owls know where to go so the ministry could have sent a letter to Sirius when he was hiding and just followed the owl. In Moana, Maui sings because Maui can do anything but float to explain why he's been stuck on an island for 1000 years. Literally in the next scene. He dives off the boat and starts to swim away. I realize it's just a Disney movie, but this annoys the crap out of me. I believe what he is trying to say is he can't survive in open water without a boat because of the monsters and his missing hook. You're welcome. In Paw Patrol, a teenager has seemingly privatized the emergency services of an entire town utilizing a band of taking dogs. None of that makes sense. And it's an island town of 25 people tops with no industrial or financial sectors, yet tax funds galore. Kids will never learn about public coffers this way. In Face Off when Caster Troy takes on the life of Sean Archer, Sean Archer's wife bangs him, as implied in the movie, but never notices he has a different dong, it's called Face Off, not Dong and Face Off. At the beginning of Waterworld, Mariner trades a few ounces of dirt for a whole bunch of goodies. The planet is covered with water, and dirt is the most valuable commodity. It took him months to gather this stuff. Later in the movie, Mariner takes the woman underwater to show her the tragedy of a drowned city. Buildings, streets, all covered with water. To highlight the sadness, Aquaman scoops up a handful of mud and lets it drift away on the current. Wait a minute, mud, wet dirt. Trillions of tons of it, just beneath the surface of the ocean, there for the taking. It didn't take him months to gather it, he got it from underwater. He is just pretending for the benefit of the humans. Redditors who have served in the military, what inaccuracy depicted in military movies infuriates you the most? Firearms are loud, very, very loud, like damaging your hearing, make death loud. You cannot talk normally during or immediately after shooting. In Iraq my most vivid memory of my first firefight was how loud it was. It was really painful actually. M4S, M249S and or M240B shooting lots of rounds all around me. I literally thought my ears were bleeding and was effectively deaf afterwards. Black Hawk down and Archer get it right. I fly Black Hawks. You cannot talk in the back of a freaking Black Hawk without a headset. Yes you can scream at the top of your lungs and they might be able to hear you. A 60 has two very freaking loud GE 701 engines and not a lot of soundproofing. Lower enlisted are predominantly young as frick looking. I just want to see one movie that has 1821 soldiers that actually look like what they are representing. 
3 combat deployment, 2008 to 2013. Former Marine here. Guns are really loud. This makes communication on the battlefield really difficult, especially in enclosed spaces. For every 10 minutes of action, there was 10 hours of planning. The constant waiting. Wait for orders. Wait for EOD. Wait for the armory. Wait for chow. Wait for the next briefing. It never ends. Not everyone has issues with combat. A lot of people don't come back really messed up. I still think a good portion of it is mentally preparing yourself for war. Crap ice and lollipops and fairy dust. Nothing goes to plan. Ever. Something will go wrong. Magazines need to be changed damn it. Your M4 doesn't hold 100 rounds. Bullets don't make a pew pew sound. They crack unless they hit some hard surface before they fly by your head. Then it's more like a zinc crack. There's some seriously fricked up things we talk about in wars and most of it could never be shown in a movie. <laughs> Served in the 1st Cavalry Division 1967 to 1973. The overly dramatic death scenes. Most people in war either die in complete agony with no glory whatsoever or die instantly as though they were never even there. One thing I hate about watching military movies is everyone dies a symbolic death is seems when in reality that's not the case. Silencers do not actually silence weapons completely like they do in movies. They dull the noise level and distort the sound, making it harder to identify as a gunshot, but you can still most certainly hear them. It's not like some tiny ping sound you hear in movies. We are not fighting 24 stroke 7. Every military movie I watch it seems like non-stop fighting. I know there has to be fighting for the sake of action and all but in reality most of the time you are not fighting and are bored out of your mind doing nothing. War. From my experience 90% weight, 10% pure adrenaline and chaos. I'm a Vietnam veteran and I've admittedly only watched a few Vietnam films but I hate 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 how it seems every Vietnam film has the same everyone's fricked in the head theme and everyone is a drafty who hates to be there. PTSD was common in Vietnam but no everyone is like the characters from Apocalypse Now. Most soldiers in Vietnam were in fact enlisted, I think the ration was too unenlisted, and the majority of us believed what we were doing there was right. Not saying percent against the war didn't exist, it did, and it grew the longer I was there, but not everyone was against it. Then again, nobody much thought of politics of Vietnam while I was there anyway, but you get the point. Endless ammo, we all run out at some point, not in the movies. You can just endlessly spray your weapon like they do in Hollywood. Also, we aren't nearly as clean shaven and good looking as Hollywood stars. Most of us are ugly, sweaty, smelly, agitated men that have and showered in weeks months. Also, military movies tend to either portray soldiers as perfect heroes who never do wrong, or, as I said earlier, broken savages. We all try to do right but sometimes we do wrong. It's never black and white. Also, the enemy is not some evil faceless army of morons as many war films portray and we are not invincible. So many war movies just make the enemy out to be completely incompetent in battle, which just isn't the case. Sometimes, we frick up just as bad as they do. Also, the enemy isn't just an enemy, they are humans too. They are also fighting for what they believe to be right and can show just as much bravery barbarity as we do. They are not faceless villains. Also, I never had my finger on the trigger unless I intended to fire. So when I see soldiers in movies just casually walking with their fingers on the trigger just makes me wince. And the uniforms are often inaccurate. Sorry for the rant. But that's about it for now. Generals and colonels, and admirals and captains, are often depicted as hard charging, dim-witted egomaniacs who have little depth of personality and are out of touch with what's really going on in their commands. In reality, senior officers are usually well educated and well spoken. Those I have worked with have been very intelligent and perceptive, and they usually have a talent for eliciting valuable input from those around them. The military's promotion systems aren't as broken as an outsider might be led to believe by Hollywood. For the most part, the armed services are promoting the best qualified officers to the field and flag grades. No, you listen here sergeant, you shoot those sick children and that's an order slams down phone. Almost every single movie I've seen with guns rifles in it whether it was a military movie or not all seem to break the rule that a mag can only hold so many bullets. There are too many movies where people will fire 50 bullets out of a handgun and somehow never had to change a mag. 
In some movies where they do actually reload it's unrealistically fast and inaccurate. Which is frustrating, because quickly changing mags is one of the few bad butt skills the army left me with. It really annoys me to see explosions that are way too Hollywood. Grenades don't set people on fire, claymores don't spark and for frick's sake 40mm rounds, and most rockets have a minimum arming distance. Not specific to military movies but how many times can you charge dong cycle a weapon before rounds start popping out? 1. It's 1. Unless you're using an M2, then it's twice. Or was that the MK? 19. Crap I can't remember now. The casual conversations on helicopters. Whole mission briefings on the helicopter right before they land. Any talking on a helicopter without a headset. Helicopters allowed. I crew UH-60s for the army, and I have to wear two sets of hearing protection at all times while the aircraft is operating. On the occasions where I need to talk to a passenger or someone not on a headset, I have to literally scream right into their ear from point blank range, and they still barely hear me. So the calm and quiet conversations I see in movies all the time really ruins my immersion. This is something that really made me love Arrival. The helicopter was incredibly loud and the script made a point of having the character learn how she had to use the headset. It also worked really as a mood device, but dang the sound mixing and engineering in that movie was interesting. I have a few. Bad guys don't always miss. Our wives don't always cheat on us when we are gone. We drink a lot more than they think. Comma we drink a lot more than they think. Yeah, it's safe to assume that every Inco and junior enlisted soldier is drunk unless otherwise noted. Former Navy enlisted, the smart but belligerent young enlisted who gets asked to fix the problem when he rushes in. Yeah, that guy, that guy isn't anywhere near anyone who gives a rat's butt about his ideas because he has been shuffled down to the crap jobs for being cocky long ago. This is the military, where you follow orders first and challenge later after the shooting is done if at all. You have a great idea? Pass it on to your next level in the chain of command. If it is a winner, it will get to the right ears but you do not just go stomping up and shout it at the officer in charge. I had good bad and indifferent bosses in my short years in the service but i always knew someone i could pass along ideas to if i had them and even got commended once or twice after for being right in the end we were all working on making crap go right and the best way to do that was to do the job given as best you could from e1 to 09 in a real crisis you would see a lot of quiet men and women working hard and paying attention just pisses me off when the smartest busts in and in the end he's getting medals and promotions and crap while his bosses are being shuffled off like incompetent losers. Next time have a chief take 10 minutes to meticulously explain why his idea is so dumb it could only have come from a life form with no identifiable brain, with specific real world examples, historic references, and a number of explicit descriptions of his familial relations back a few generations before he is thrown in the brig while everyone else goes back to work and saves the freaking ship. He. I hate that the military is kind of a catch-all backstory for any character that is supposed to be a badass. Like, some guy spends a few years in the military and then gets out and goes back to his hometown. And he has all the training he needs to single-handedly take on his town's army of drug dealers, corrupt cops, whatever. I'm sure there are some special forces types that might fit that profile. But most of us get out of the military and we're really good at, like, PowerPoint and crap. The vast majority of the military is made up of just regular but people who went to boot camp. They might be able to knock out a few more push-ups than the average civilian. But most of us spend an average day in the military looking at screens or driving trucks or filling out paperwork, like everyone else. I was in military intelligence, end of cold war. I can analyze the frick out of reports, extrapolate troop movements, even gather some of my own intelligence in the right circumstances. I can even shoot my M16A2 pretty well, I'd know frick all about taking down a drug ring, mob boss, etc. I've posted this before, but it's worth saying again. For me, all the inaccuracies about uniforms, weapons, tactics, ranks, facial hair, etc, etc, nothing bothers me as much as the inaccurate way soldiers are depicted. Generally, they aren't made out to be real people. They are either superhero ninja badasses, or broken vulnerable disadvantaged kids who've been taken advantage of, or psychotic killers without brains or consciences. 
The fact of the matter is, soldiers are just people, a cross section of society, with all, good and bad, that it entails. Unfortunately, many movies can't seem to figure that out, mostly, I think, because they are products of a society that has very little familiarity with the military they pay so much for and sent to far, flung places on the map to do things they'd rather not know or think about. I think Generation Kill did a good job depicting the way people in the military actually talk to each other. I am an avionics mechanic in the Air Force. In the movie Conair they take the transponder from the cargo plane and put it in a Cessna which leads to the FBI following the wrong plane. However, what they really put in the Cessna was just the APX-72 control panel. In no way would it transmit anything on its own even with the battery they wired to it. This always bugged me. That is an incredibly specific one. I've said this before and I'll say it again, not everyone in the army comes from a small town no one's ever heard of, yeah, there's definitely a lot of dudes like that but there's also plenty of people from New York, Baltimore, Cleveland, Dallas, Los Angeles, Boston, Miami, Chicago, I mean not all of us are pickup driving, tobacco chewing rednecks engaged to our high school sweetheart, heck, my company had guys from at least 4 or 5 different countries. Also, that movie Stop Loss, yeah frick that movie, Home of the Brave 2. Also don't ask a veteran if the guy who told you he was in the special forces was actually in the SF. Because the answer is always number. Seriously, think about it, special operations chooses from a very specific type of soldier with a very specific type of personality. The type of soldier with a type of personality who doesn't sit on Xbox live bragging about being SF. Never once saw a military movie where the new guy was approached to join Amway or some other MLM scam within 10 minutes of people meeting him. That crap was like a cancer when I was in. Uniforms and customs and courtesies. Every single thing you would ever need to know is a Google search away, yet they routinely show men and women that are simply egregious. Collars worn a weird way, women's hair touching a collar, flashy jewelry, salutes where their hand is jacked up, etc. In the real world if you are even close to any of that, an E9 will swoop down and make your life a living heck for as long as they want. It's just laziness on the part of the film crew. So many times, you see a 3-4 star general walking around with the cover on indoors. You see hair and facial hair out of rags. You see people in blues in the most unlikely situations. I know it's really minor, but little uniform violations really annoy me. Things like missing patches, badges in the wrong place, untucked bootlaces, etc. It's not that hard to comply to uniform standards. It seems lazy to me for a director to not take the 10 minutes he would need to figure all this stuff out. Little uniform violations really annoy me. That's what took me right the frick out of Home of the Brave within the first 10 minutes. The actual suckiness of the rest of the movie walked me around the corner and beat my butt. When military grade means the absolute best and indestructible. In reality, military grade means the lowest bidder made this and it sucks and we overpaid for it. I work for a company making bulletproof windows for Humvees and MRAPS. You can definitely tell we were the lowest bidder. The entire movie that is the Hurt Locker. I don't have enough time in my day to explain that giant pile of steaming horseshit. Language. Nkos aren't called sir. A female officer isn't called sir. Marines aren't soldiers. The list goes on and on. Saluting without a cover on. Indoors. Uniforms. Jesus frick. Look at Google for 10 minutes. So I'm normally a roll with it person when it comes to this stuff. But I should note I can't watch much about the current conflict. However, the single most enraging thing. That made me yell at the screen constantly. The first G.I. Joe movie. Duke's character is supposed to be a major, and wear captain's bars. Or maybe vice versa. It peed me off every time he got on the screen. Such a small thing. That I'm sure someone in props thought was funny. The vast majority of people who served are not combat vets. Even deployed most of us. Support folks. Are not in that much danger. The vast majority of us have civilian equivalent jobs. There are as many dumbasses and pieces of crap in the military as there are in civilian life. Overall the pay for military is good. Some jobs it's not when all things are considered. Mainly combat jobs. It's hard to nail down just one. 
But I'll mention one that hasn't been mentioned yet, the talking. Apparently everyone in the military has a pretty crappy fake sounding southern accent and doesn't know the difference between the letter O and the number zero. Along with the talking comes the lingo. A member of the marine corps is not a soldier. A member of the navy is not an airman. A member of the army is not a sailor. A member of the air force is not a marine. Here, I'll make it simple. Army equals soldier. Marines equals marine. Navy equals sailor. Air force equals airman. Also, over and out on the radio. Just, why? The other thing they freak up is unit sizes. I can't remember the exact movie. It was some director TV Siffy channel style balls. But the captain asks the general to give him a platoon to go rescue some POWs. The general says I can't spare a platoon. I can only give you a brigade. A platoon is around 2550 men. A brigade is 3 or more battalions. Or around 2000 men. Grenades. There is not a huge explosion that throws people all over. Medium bang and lots of nasty little chunks of metal that shred. That's what I loved about Lone Survivor. No fire why big explosions. This will probably get downvoted to crap for answering the complete opposite of the question. But I saw the scene in World War Z that was astoundingly accurate. On the naval ship they escape on. There's a 5 minute conversation and in the background there's some sailor putting gravy on his mashed potatoes. Even during a zombie apocalypse. Freaking piece of crap Airedales have nothing better to do than hold up the chow line by precisely gravying their third helping of potatoes. But it's flight quarters so we have to skip the line. Everyone's a freaking officer. The movies shows that recognize the existence of enlisted still make it out to be a 2. 1 officer to enlisted ratio. Aside from the enlisted versus. Officer salt. The organization that such a top heavy scheme would have makes no sense. Think Stargate SG-1. For example, there is no way that a four-man team would include both a colonel and a major. At most, there would be a sergeant in charge of that team. And even that is freaking generous. Cole. O'Neill would be riding a desk and probably wouldn't even ever see the Stargate, let alone walk through it. That's always bothered me on Stargate. On the other hand if there is a fi fight on Earth they send SG-1 including the archaeologist. You almost never hear about logistics when any kind of mission is being planned. Okay, you guys go here and kill those guys and then blow that crap up and that's it. There are literally hundreds of details that need to be worked out for any mission. I realize it would be boring to go through all of that, but it should at least be referenced. Comma my logisticians are a humorous lot. They know if my campaign fails, they are the first ones I will slay. Alexander the Great. God am right. Amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. Served 25 years in the Legio 9 Hispana. I gotta say, the depiction of Roman military combat and attire in Ridley Scott's Gladiator, 2000, was rather appalling. For one thing, we never used napalm, so lord knows how the opening battle featured exploding fireballs. I mean the Byzantines had Greek fire, but that wouldn't show up until much later. Also, how the heck did Maximus gallop from the Iberian Peninsula back to Central Europe in a day? He sets off with a bleeding wound, and arrives back home, 300 miles away, still bleeding. I'll say this much though, the frost really does make the blade stick. 99.8% of military movies are so terrible fact-wise that I've learned to just pretend I don't know anything and enjoy the story. How they wear the uniform in most movies. I always see the collar up and velcroed, not a word, and you only do that when you put on body armor that has a neck guard which rubs your neck. Also, wrong patches in the wrong place. Pretty much any movie that acts like all the soldiers are heroes and if they are dying they say crap like give this to my son ooh, dead. No, really those that get injured freaking cry and display pain worse than you can imagine, especially if they know they are not gonna make it. Also, if you are in a fi fight and your best friend next to you gets shot in the head, you don't stop shooting to dress the wound. Only the medic stops shooting to take care of someone injured. We are trained to never cease firing whatsoever to help someone due to the fact that the enemy could advance and possibly overrun us if certain weapons stop firing. It could be one person dies, or an entire platoon. We choose the one overall. Every movie when they are patrolling or walking somewhere, 
they are way too close to each other, and having a goddamn loud butt conversation. Shut the frick up and spread out. That soft units are always 100% on ready to kill 100% of the time. And that they are either complete professionals or they break from command and go rogue all while getting away with it. You will find so much debauchery and sarcastic cynicism. Nothing is really taken seriously, unless it needs to be. Oh and the other big thing. That special forces units operate on their own, without any help. SEALs and GBs both deploy with pretty big attachments of support guys. Guys that operators depend on, but never get referenced. A 100% legit conversation I had with a JTF2 operator. Those Delta Force buttholes ate all the ice cream. Double quote. Kinda took the bloom off the rose. Pretty much anything involving fixed wing aircraft. How they fly. Capabilities. Weapons used. Tactics. Weapons used against them. Etc. Absolutely freaking absurd. Case in point. Behind enemy lines. That scene when Owen Wilson is flying a Hornet and gets shot at by a Sam. Think it was an SAR-6 or something. Would have to look back. But the thing is freaking chasing him around for 5 minutes doing loops and flying through tunnels and crap. Not a freaking chance. Those missiles are going supersonic and while they can pull more G's than a fighter jet. At that speed it looks like more of a gradual curve. If it misses the first time, it's gone. That every person in the military is not a hard charging war machine. I am 6 feet 3 weigh 215 pounds, 95 kilograms ish for our metric friends and can shoot the eye out of a sparrow at 50 yards slash 48 m ish. However, I was an air traffic controller in the army. I never loaded around into my M16 in Afghanistan. I literally worked an 8 hour shift in an air traffic control tower every night. I trained other air traffic controllers. We lived in armored, air conditioned shipping containers and played basketball and ping pong in our off time. I took a shower every day, no hot water but still. I have friends who had crap deployments and got shot at and mortared every day. I have more friends who sat in an office or did some other menial task every day for 12 hours a day while in a hot dusty room in a foreign country. ATC. Former 35D here. I fixed Wiles equipment when it fell apart cause you breathed on it wrong. Well, I tried, anyway. Okay, I did my best to keep the magic smoke inside the goddamn radar, cussing you guys the whole way. Not what you asked, but what I've decided to answer. Two scenes movies that I've found incredibly accurate. One, in Hacksaw Ridge, when the protagonist gets to boot camp and Vince Vaughn comes in, sure it's a little out of place and overdone. But I can almost guarantee everyone who has been through military indoctrination has had that instructor who welcomed everyone with screaming and managed to assign a couple of nicknames in the first instant of meeting everyone. Yes, it made me giggle when I watched it on screen. But it also made me flash back to my first week in the military. The nickname was Dutch Oven and no, it wasn't me. 2. Captain Phillips was filmed in an actual destroyer. Yes, the passageways are that narrow and the ladders are that steep. And they got all but one of the standard commands correct. It helps when actual US sailors are playing some of the roles. Former Navy nuclear reactor operator here. One doesn't have a fight scene next to a topper reactor and expect to avoid death by radiation sickness poisoning. Thank you. Current Navy nuclear operator. Literally anything to do with nuclear power or naval combat. Regardless of what's going on. We're still just taking logs. Hate it when a subordinate, usually enlisted, talks back to a high ranking officer and makes him her do something out of the ordinary because it will save the mission. That crap rarely happens. We usually just shut the frick up and follow instructions. Sure, if something is dangerous we speak up, but always respectfully. Discipline among the soldiers. Yes among your average soldiers the discipline isn't over the top. But a lot of movies will feature some highly specialized unit that will have little to no respect for rank or any level of professionalism. Also, every highly trained and elite soldier I have met has been very calm, professional and polite. They have never been the show off, braggart and in your face butthole movies tend to feature. When you are that highly trained you don't need to prove something to everybody. Yes, among others who are trained as well as you are you might compete. But the average soldier or civilian can't even compare and they know it so there is no reason to show off. 
Also, commanders complaining something to the effect of that soldier thinks too much, implying that the military wants mindless troops that follow orders without question or thought. This one really pisses me off. The US military wants intelligent soldiers. There is a reason why they pay for and provide a variety of ways for soldiers to get more education. Furthermore, while I was in basic we had several classes on what constitutes an illegal order, how to tell an officer that you can't follow their order and how to report illegal orders. 8 years US Army. I was a mechanic at a hospital unit for the majority but I met more than a few hardcore badass soldiers in my time. My boyfriend was an armorer in the army. The thing that irritates him the most is the inaccuracies on the weapons. That type of gun can't do that that's not a standard weapon in the army. What the frick that's not how bombs work. At all. Gasoline explosions. Good, you'd swear a battlefield was one giant pile of gas cans. Napalm notwithstanding. Spielberg and Hanks have gotten weapons and explosions right. And the movie Fury. Aircraft scenes. Frick. I'd fire 95% of the CGI directors in Hollywood if possible. They have aircraft doing impossible moves, or cram the screen full of them. Naval scenes. The whole fleet occupying about one square mile of ocean. All the only battleships bombarding islands were Iowa class BBs. The fast BBs stayed with the carriers to provide AA defense. The OBS, think Pearl Harbor ships, were used mainly for shore bombardment. What scene in a movie really irritated the crap out of you? It makes my blood boil every time a racing movie shows some driver who is behind just drop a gear, floor it, and catch up get ahead. If you weren't already pushing your car to its limit while racing what the heck were you doing? Yeah, it's the now I'm really mad secret gear. It's a tiny little thing. But several years ago I saw a movie where a female character was kicked in the crotch and she didn't react at all. Women might not have some bits that men have, but a blow to the crotch freaking hurts like heck. The stigmatis scene in the butterfly effect. If you call a movie the butterfly effect then the smallest a change in the past will change the future. And it did up until the prison stigmatis scene. Complete bulls and shoots on the movie's idea of time travel. The movie tries so hard to follow some very specific rules then changes them when the scene needs to wrap up. In WW84 when literally every other wish appears out of thin air, but bringing Diana's guy back involves taking over some random guy's life and using him as a meat puppet for sex, and then ransacking his apartment for a dumb 80s clothes montage all the while ignoring the fact that this guy had a life, work, family, family, at least it gave him the ability to fly a jet with no training. Alien vs. Predator. It's been a while but it went something like this. The Maya used the decimal system so the next event must be in 10 minutes. Anytime in movies when they hit someone over the head to knock them out for a while. If you watch boxing or MMA, knockouts usually put them down but they aren't unconscious for long. And if a hit is strong enough to knock you out for a long period of time, it is most likely a serious injury. It's not like going to sleep. You would be fricked up afterward. Especially annoying if it's a good guy move. For example, the hero knocking his friend unconscious in order to stop him from going into a dangerous place. Oh thanks Mike. You just stopped Jim from going into a burning building but you also broke his jaw in 5 places and he bashed his head on the concrete so he'll be dealing with a skull fracture. Great. Thanks. That over the top. Long as freak sex scene in Matrix 2. We get it they are having earth shattering sex. Get to the bullet dodging dang it. Still better than the cave rave. The ending and the rise of Skywalker. JJ. Abrams couldn't come up with a cooler villain. So he just said oh, Palpatine's back now, guys. Palpatine, kill me, Ray. I won't kill you. Palpatine, kill me, Ray. Okay, okay, old man, I'm gonna kill you. Palpatine, you could never kill me. <laughs> Fights, 1. In Pet Cemetery, 1989. The movie would have been solved in 15 minutes if only the Creed family would have bought a dang fence. A metal one. A tall one. Seen in Unbreakable when Sam Jackson reveals Bruce Willis's one weakness. Something like, when you drink water too fast, you choke, you know, like all of the rest of US. Follow up. 241. 
Bruce Willis by god he's right. I am a superhero. I should fight crime because the only thing that can stop me is water. Leaves house for first super outing. In a poncho. In the rain. Over a pool. Not a scene. But new Netflix movies have been irritating me a lot lately because of bad audio quality. By bad. I mean. You can barely hear dialogues over the background music and the loudness is not consistent across scenes. I have to keep adjusting the volume. I love the lot of movies. But the scenes when Frodo is almost succumbing to the ring or is hurt. Where it goes all slow mo and close up and he groans. Just feel like they linger a few seconds too long. He makes one specific groan that always reminds me of the toilet scene in Austin Powers. One of the newer Star Wars. They're being chased by a massive ship, one so big it could turn sideways and hit the good guys with its wingtips, but instead it shoots lasers at them. Lasers that fall over distance, in the emptiness of space, with no obvious gravity source to induce the fall. Big gripe I had with the newer series of movies is that they broke the envelope every chance they could, just like every time Poe is in a ship such as him hyperspace jumping every 3 seconds either Falcon and somehow not being instantly killed or losing his tail after doing it once, it was just unnecessary. The overpass tornado scene in Man of Steel and not for the obvious reasons of oh man Superman can save his dad, or his dad could literally use three different ways of getting out of the way or not even he has to hide blah 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 but because, you are telling me a family long lived in freaking Kansas is not listening to weather radar or paying attention and then hide in a freaking overpass which is the last thing you do if a twister's coming your way, I literally walked out, only time I ever did and it got me so mad, waste of money. I later watched the rest and found it mediocre but enjoyable but I will never watch that scene again. Inaccurate tornado safety messaging is an amusingly specific reason to not like that film. The theatrical ending on I Am Legend with Will Smith. They completely betrayed the spirit of the movie, as well as any coherence with previous scenes. The book is a masterpiece. Every adaptation is garbage except the graphic novel. Had the Raz reveal never happened, I would seriously consider Wonder Woman the best DC movie ever released. Instead, it severely diminished the entire point of having to endure bad people, let alone war in the first place. Now I could just blame Raz for everything. The Holocaust 9-11? Raz did it. The Hunt for Red October is my favorite movie ever. But Jack Ryan explaining turbulence to a flight attendant on a transatlantic flight is ridiculous. The big fight scene in The Dark Knight Rises with all of the cops etc. You can see half of them just punching thin air. The Bourne Ultimatum. A series I love. But when Noah Vosen tells Nikki back up will arrive in approximately one hour because he knows Bourne is listening on the phone conversation. Come on. One hour. Nebula escaping that anti-gravity laser prison by grabbing a thing and hitting a guy in Endgame. My biggest action movie pet peeve is when there's no onus on the characters to figure out clever solutions to things. That's where the tension comes from. Every time John McClane survives an encounter in Die Hard he does so with his wits. In some way you probably wouldn't have thought of yourself. So when he ends up in danger, you know he can't just magically kung fu his way through 5 armed bad guys. And then you feel nervous wondering what he will do in a seeming no win scenario. But in a lot of action movies. They just break dance out of danger or shoot some red explosive barrel in the background to get away. Or they use some magical glow stick thing to burrow an impossible distance under the ground at superhuman speeds despite not being superhuman. Or some other dumb cheats code crap that destroys all the tension. Just watched 50 Shades of Grey for the first time. Literally the entire movie irritated me. I get it's meant to be a fantasy type crap for the viewers but who tf goes for round 2 after just losing their virginity. Well, obviously the girl who is not like other girls because she's different. In Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, Rey's Jedi powers were wildly inconsistent. Early in the movie, she holds back what must be a 100 ton trooper carrier from blasting off. In mid-flight, with the mere power of her mind, bit later, when being chased by dumb troopers, she's running, hiding, missing her shots etc. You have the power to hold and cause a spaceship to crash, but can't wave away a few puny men. Later, she's in a near panic state climbing a high structure, 
but is still able in other instances to jump great heights and incredible distance. I call it the Jedi power of script convenience. I think this is super common in movies and shows when the writers make a character too powerful and have to explain it away with lazy plot devices. The TV show Heroes was really bad with this having characters whose power was so strong they had to be really bad at controlling them or have some reason they couldn't use them in certain situations. Every horror movie scene where the character decides to be curious and look for the source of a noise, etc and the jump scare that follows. Anytime there is a briefcase with 10 dollars million or some other crazy amount of money, you could barely fit a million, that is if it is new crisp bills. In the last airbender though it doesn't count as a scene, but in the opening lines of the movie they mispronounced avatar and said avatar instead of avatar, the movie was terrible but that was the first sign I was gonna be worried for the movie. Oh oh oh. I don't have a specific one in my mind, but surely everyone despises that scene where character A could easily tell character B something massively integral to the plot but because they fail to bother, all heck breaks loose and someone dies, etc. Work. It's why I hate rom-coms too. In the 2009 Star Trek reboot, that little joke scene where Chekhov can't turn the ship's parking brake off because he can't pronounce the V in Victor, because of his Russian accent. Think about the idiocy for a second. The man's name is Chekhov v v v v v v v v v v with a V at the end. Of course he can pronounce a V. Russian has other notable V words such as vodka, Victor, and Vladimir. But no, we're going to make a Russian man no pronounce V letter LOL joke. But it gets worse. Instead of pronouncing the V, he pronounces it with a W. Victor. Again, because of his Russian accent. The absolute tricycle brain part is that Russian doesn't have a W sound. Not only would a Russian person not struggle pronouncing a V sound, but they wouldn't ever pronounce a W sound. Because there is no such sound in their language. It's possible this bothers me more than it should. In Man of Steel, Jonathan Kent suggesting that maybe Clark should have let the busload of kids die. Also when he tells Clark not to save him and Clark let him die. I basically can't save anyone and the tornado will kill me. You could save everyone and this thing is like a mellow breeze for you. I go. I go. Any car wreck scene where people are perfectly fine afterwards. Or just hop up with a gunshot wound and keep going full force. Like humans actually do feel pain. Wrecks hurt bad. Bullets make giant painful debilitating holes in your body. They are not like mosquito bites. To be fair, adrenaline can allow you to do some amazing things even when mortally wounded. In Edge of Tomorrow, why didn't Tom Cruise just use the device right there in the general's office to learn the alien secrets, then immediately kill himself? He would just reset to the start of the day having all the new intel in his mind, and the military wouldn't be after him. Instead, he tries to escape from the building before using the alien tech, ends up getting into an accident, receives a blood transfusion, and loses his time travel powers. That was such a contrived way to set up a third act where the stakes are higher again because he can die permanently. The magic pill scenes. I've said it before. Any time where a character is having a psychotic episode, they scramble for their pills, swallow it, poof all the voices are gone. I'd love to see a movie where the character comes down over the course of 30 minutes or something. When you first see Hulk in End War, don't tease this whole potential development story for Bruce and Hulk to figure their stuff out and just show us that he's meshed both together. I wanted to see how it happens but I still want his autograph. Not one specific scene as this happens very so often, but when a scene is in the dark and you can't see anything of the action, then there's a flash of light, you can see a bit, probably a close up of an actor. I remember Game of Thrones having a lot of these scenes. I just want to see what's going on. The scene in Aragorn where Sephira flies for the first time and immediately grows up and knows things. Ruined the whole movie. Glossed over my favorite part of the book and is my personal worst book to movie adaptation. Indiana Jones surviving a nuclear explosion in a fridge. It just felt like this jumping the shark moment. My buddy turned to me in the theater and said, want to leave I said no and regret watching that whole turd. In Jurassic Park when Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler are trying to hold the door shut as the raptor tried to get into the room, she desperately tries to reach for the gun with her foot, 
unable to move her back from the door lest the raptor break in. Meanwhile Timmy is just sitting there watching his sister try to hack into the security system and not retrieving the gun for one of the adults. Watch Timmy for that entire scene and you'll see the actor just kinda wigging out in a really funny way. The ending of Zack Snyder's Justice League, without giving away too many details. Who the frick releases a 4 hour movie to end it on a cliffhanger with the plot half resolved, especially when they know they're not going to be directing a sequel, otherwise brilliant movie, but angered me beyond belief. Any scene in 50 shades of grey, it's so awkward and cliche and it's not a true portrayal of BDSM it's a f. Boy getting his rocks off on an emotionally vulnerable girl who then turns into a manipulative moron whilst the viewer is supposed to feel that's it's some iconic feminist action. The whole blatant ego driven control issues and trying to romanticize being treated badly or unwillingness to properly discuss consent really annoys me. Yet every single person from the BDSM community I have ever talked to and observed says this movie is horrid for holy crap so many reasons that just listing them creates a paradox. In episode 2 F09, when Ichi plays Scratchy's skeleton like a xylophone, he strikes the same rib in succession, yet he produces two clearly different tones. I mean, what are we to believe, that this is a magic xylophone, or something? Haha, ha, boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. Basically the entire Ant-Man movie, the first time Scott Lang shrinks, he falls to the floor and breaks the tile. The movie teaches the audience that only his size has changed, not his mass. Then later, he rides a flying ant and runs up gun barrels as if he is nearly weightless. Movies should remain internally consistent with the rules they establish. When the writer provides a cool set piece just to show you that R I am Verismut, then promptly abandons the principle, just frick you, dude. And the tank keychain. The whole of Tenet, audio was muffled, barely comprehended crap on top of not knowing what is being said, I had to rewatch with subs man but it was pee good still, I like it. The scene in a beautiful mind that tries to explain the Nash equilibrium, group of dudes at a bar checking out a group of chicks, all are good looking, but there's one girl in particular they all agree is the best looking. The movie claims that the equilibrium is that nobody goes after her because if all of them approach her, nobody gets her and her friends wouldn't give them the time of day afterwards. The problem is if nobody goes for the blonde then there's an incentive for you to go for her. It's not the actual Nash equilibrium. I mean it is supposed to be him getting his first inspiration, rather than a demonstration of his finished theory. Anytime Don Cheadle opens his mouth in Ocean's Eleven, not only is it a bad cockney accent, but it might actually be one of the worst accents ever put to film. It's a shame because he's a good actor and it's a good film, but god does that accent great. In my mind, Cheadle's character is actually faking an accent. He went to England on a job and came back talking that way. Nothing in the film suggests this, but it works for me. CPR every time. I know, I know, we don't want to break the actor's ribs, you could at least snore throw in stupid stuff like punching instead of compressions. Agree CPR when the person's heartbeat comes back and they sit up like nothing happened. But, as for the punch look up precordial thump, it's an actual technique. Saving Private Ryan when that dude's cowering on the staircase while all mates getting knifed slowly. Different irritation to the other comparisons here. While I understand how frustrating it is to watch that scene, I love that it is in the movie. Not everyone is a hero. War is terrifying. And people get scared. I care a lot. Spoilers ahead. To lay the groundwork, Roman is a very hardcore international gangster. Powerful and all too happy to kill the people who deserve it. Marla is a scammer who preys on the old and disabled. Marla screws with Roman's mother. Roman is P. Now we've got this scene, where the two are sitting across from each other, instead of ending it there and then, personally, like how it's implied he would at the beginning of the dang movie, he gives the job to his lackeys, she survives, because reasons, the move was just completely out of character, that's my biggest issue, not to mention the later scenes which just stop making any sense, it's like the writers lost the plot midway through the movie, this one just really grinded my gears. I turned it off when she started going full action hero. Alright Reddit, 
What are some of the biggest movie plot holes that you know of? In Eurotrip, why did he have to go all the way to Europe after she blocked his email address? Couldn't he have sent her an email from a different email address? My god. Why don't people believe the Ghostbusters in Ghostbusters II? They already saved New York City. For the same mayor. Yes mayor. I know the river of slime sounds ridiculous. But so does a giant marshmallow man. In Captain America. At the base camp scouts report that they have seen no sign of Captain's team and presume them dead. Only to have them roll in through the front gates less than a minute later to triumphant music. With a tank. Painted in enemy colors. Blinken must have been on guard duty again. Cars. On the freeway, we see at least one van with a mattress on top. Who is using the mattresses? Every Christmas movie, the parents never believe in Santa, but presents are put under the tree on Christmas night. How do the parents think these presents are getting there? That makes me really angry. Each assume the other bought such and such present I guess. My favorite of men are from the butterfly effect. In prison, Ashton Kutcher's character shows his cellmate his palms, then travels back in time to give himself stigmatous scars as a kid. Back in the present his cellmate recoils in surprise from seeing those scars, which had, in the new timeline, been there all along. Yeah, I loved that movie the first time I saw it, but enjoyed it less with each subsequent viewing as the holes started to get to me. Any new viewers should simply watch the director's cut on DVD with the proper, original, way cooler ending, and never watch it again. Not a movie, but in the magic school bus maze, Frizzle takes a class on a trip inside Arnold to study the digestive system. On a pan of the bus you can clearly see Arnold with his classmates while they are inside of him. Magic school bus. Oz. How did the hat stay on a Debussy's head? I read a great explanation regarding this. The hat is too afraid to drop. It makes sense really. In I Am Legend. If they destroyed all of the bridges and filled in all of the tunnels to get to Manhattan. An island. How did the lady and her son get there? And with a car? It made more sense in the book. When she was a vampire. And the plot was different. In Threat Level Midnight, the supposedly corrupt president calls the main character at the end and gives him another mission, which said character gladly accepts. In the first Spider-Man movie, there is a scene where Spidey lands on top of Empire State Building, and you can clearly see that another Empire State Building is in the far background. Basically, they digitally edited the scene to make him land on the ESB instead of the World Trade Center, but forgot to change the background image. In the Marvel Universe, there are two Empire State Buildings. In Limitless, I didn't get why the main character didn't just figure out how to make more pills as soon as he found them. I didn't get why he didn't just pay the bad guy as soon as he had the money. That would have been a top priority for me. Jurassic Park 2 the Lost World. The ship that the T-Rex and Baby are on crashes into the docks because all the people on the ship, including on the bridge, have been eaten. Who ate them? The T-Rex and Baby were in the cargo hold the whole time. They removed the scene, but it was actually raptors. It always bothered me that in signs, the aliens were spoilers deadly reactant to water, but they decided to take over a planet that is 80% water, where everyone and everything on earth has a madly high water content? I think Cracked compared it to us finding a planet that was 80% acid, and the air contained acid vapor, and the acid occasionally fell from the sky, and the inhabitants were walking bags of acid, and our battle plan was to engage in hand to hand combat naked. National Treasure 2. How does finding the lost city prove that his relative wasn't a part of the Lincoln assassination? You're right. This would have made more sense if they were to steal the Declaration of Independence. I had an issue with Inception. Both Fisher, the guy being incepted, and Sato, his biggest business rival, are on the same plane, and then together in Fisher's dreams. Yet Fisher doesn't recognize the guy either on the plane or in his dreams. Any decent businessman, and especially one that's about to inherit a huge empire, should know who his biggest rival is and what he looks like. In the room, Mark is jogging with Tommy at the park and back at the house at the same time, due to an editing error. Also because the room. 
Terminator 2. Arnold melts himself down to rid the present of his technology, but forgets to bring his arm that was ripped off a few minutes earlier. In the movie The Rock, Sean Connery is needed to break into Alcatraz because he is one of the only people to have successfully escaped. At one point he has to roll through a furnace, timing the moving parts perfectly, something he spent a significant amount of time memorizing while incarcerated, in order to get back inside the prison building. Once inside he opens a door to let the rest of the commando team into the prison so they can go foil some terrorist plot. Here's the problem, if the door only opens from the inside, why did he have to roll out of the furnace during his escape years earlier? Why wouldn't he just open the door? Dumb and Dumber, Lloyd and Harry pick up the kidnapper they think is a hitchhiker, but in a scene earlier the kidnappers say they, Lloyd and Harry, must have been following us for weeks. Why would the kidnapper pose as a hitchhiker if they suspected Lloyd and Harry were following them? They would recognize them. Good catch. I love Dumb and Dumber. I've seen it a lot of times, and this never occurred to me. In the Shawshank Redemption when he breaks open the pipe and all sorts of pressurized crap and toilet water squirt out, then he goes in there and it's not even a quarter full. In Primer, why didn't Guy 2 in Timeline 4 come back to Timeline 3 and destroy the box so Guy 1 in Timeline 8 couldn't go back in time to Timeline 5 and fold the box into Timeline 6? This still made more sense than the movie. The first Transformers movie, where the heck was barricade during the final fight. In episode 2 F09, when Itchy plays Scratchy's skeleton like a xylophone, he strikes the same rib twice in succession, yet he produces two clearly different tones. I mean, what are we to believe, that this is some sort of a magic xylophone or something? Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. Home Alone. They made it clear that the phones were down, your power is fixed but your phone lines are a mess. It's gonna take Marbella a couple of days to patch them up. The family tries calling from France but can't get through. Kevin somehow orders a pizza. Insult. The whole freaking ending of the movie is a plot hole. Salt has to flee from the CIA because no one believes she saved the president and stopped the bomb from going off. However, the freaking president of the United States witnessed her do just that. Spoiler, I'm sure he could have just been all. Nah, bro, she's solid. Horrible movie but if memory serves the dude knocks the president out before she gets there and he is unconscious during the ensuing fight over the launch controls. Rufus never tells Bill and Ted his name. They only learn it from their future selves. This creates a very weird paradox. I drove through Kansas a couple weeks back, totally killed the Wizard of Oz for me, no way you would ever want to leave Oz to get back to Kansas. I always wondered why she wanted to go back, crap, her hometown was so boring that it wasn't even in color. Don't know if anyone put this up yet, but the rock has a massive plot hole in it, so John Mason. Sean Connery, escaped from Alcatraz sometime in 1963 after being in on the The Rock for one year. He was put in The Rock for stealing super secret documents from J. Edgar Hoover's files. Files that contained national secrets that could be paid dirt in the hands of any foreign government, even an ally like the UK. This doesn't bother me. What bothers me is that they allege that in these files is information on the Kennedy assassination. In fact, in the end of the film, Mason tells Goodspeed, Nick Cage, the location of the microfilm files. The closing shot of the film is Goodspeed looking through a loop and saying to his girlfriend honey, do you want to know who shot Kennedy? Here's the rub, JFK, blown away November 22, 1963, Alcatraz, closed the 21st of March, 1963, John Mason, locked up in Alcatraz, sometime in 1962. How the frick did John Mason get locked up for taking information about an event that hadn't taken place yet? How did Goodspeed have photos of an event that was at least a year after the files were stolen? The Battle for Los Angeles. Fault tolerance. Really? Why does every alien movie, who has far superior technology, never use fault tolerance they always use a single point of failure? There is always a core or mothership or some crap so that if one point of failure is destroyed, they all fall like dominoes. Pisses me off every time. Also, signs. Aliens who are vulnerable to water attack a planet that is 80% water really? I saw the grey over the weekend. 
He swam in a creek river in freezing cold temperatures, then when he got out they didn't address hypothermia or him being cold at all. It's Liam Neeson, that's why. The new Star Trek movie. Kirk destroyed the giant drill of doom with a dang blaster, really? Earth Vulcan didn't have any aircraft that could've at bare minimum kamikazed into that sob? Why didn't Harry see the Thestrals at the end of Goblet of Fire? He had just witnessed Cedric's murder. JKR has explained this. It hadn't sunken in yet. Similarly, even though Harry may have witnessed Lily's death, he was too young to remember for it to have a significant effect on him. At the beginning of war e we see that giant destructive dust storms are common. How the frick are the people supposed to deal with that when they get back to earth at the end? The only reason that one plant can survive is because it was protected in that refrigerator before Wally -E finds it. Earth was clearly not ready for humans to return, but in the credits it's implied that they are thriving. Life a- 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 finds. A way. The premise of Armageddon is that it is easier to train drill workers to be astronauts than to train astronauts to work a drill. They're the best dang drillers on the planet. Nobody in the Simpsons movie digs under the freaking dome. In G.I. Joe, they blow up the ice and it sinks crushing the base below. In A New Hope when the Millennium Falcon leaves the Death Star to regroup with the rebels on Yavin 4, whilst making good their escape, Leia makes note that the Empire most likely is tracking them, so why in the heck did they not stop the ship, remove the tracker, and get on with their lives? It would have given the rebels more time to prepare their assault, and eliminated that the Death Star will be in range in, 5 minutes, mantra. What I never got about Snow White's plot, her evil stepmother is vain, wanting to be the hottest woman in the kingdom, and the mirror tells her, sorry, no, that's Snow White, well, while the queen has some milfage going on, she's passing 40 years old, maybe 50, even if she kills Snow White, there are likely thousands of women hotter than her anyhow, she'd go back totty mirror to gloat and be shocked to find that there's another girl, and another, and another, and worst of all, in order to kill Snow White, she drinks a potion to turn herself into a hag to disguise herself, um, hello, even if you kill your rival, you now have wrinkles, no teeth and nasty warts oozing hag pus, it just doesn't make sense if her motive is vanity, and if she does have the power to turn herself into a hag, why doesn't she just make a rejuvenating potion instead that gives her a facelift, tummy tuck and breast implants heck, she could have given herself any look she wanted, if she can change her appearance at will, why not just become hotter? So many plot holes in that story. She looks in the mirror every day in her life, and it always says that she's the hottest, until one day when it's like UHH. Actually, this chick just turned 18, so are you. Shawshank Redemption. Man, that hole was pretty freaking big. Biggest plot hole in Shawshank Redemption was where Andy wore the warden's suit. Andy is much taller and a much different shape than the warden. It wouldn't have worked out, at all. Titanic. If the movie is supposed to be Rose's account of what happened on the Titanic then why does it include scenes for which she was not present? Even scenes that had nothing to do with her. The part where the captain dies, etc. The usual suspects. If Kobayashi is a fictional character then why does he pick up verbal from the police station? You could say that he was real, and the name Kobayashi was made up. But if that's the case then whose vision of the story are we watching? It can't be verbals because he knows the truth. But it can't be the policeman, because they wouldn't know who guy whose fake name is Kobayashi was. One more. The Dark Knight. The scene where Joker crashes the party and Batman jumps out the window after Rachel. What the frick happens at the party? It just cuts to the next scene and we're, I guess, supposed to assume that Joker just peaced out. I love Batman Begins and all and it feels sacrilegious to be posting negatively about Christopher Nolan's Batman series on Reddit, but Ra's al Ghul was planning on giving the toxin to all of Gotham by vaporizing the water supply. Whatever happened to the fact that humans are mostly comprised of water themselves? Also smaller thing but I have always loved that in Spider-Man 2 Doc Ock needs tritium for his reactor. You know, the same tritium that is an isotope of hydrogen and is used in some glow in the dark watch dials and such. I love how in Spider-Man 2 the human computer interface he uses to control the arms for the fusion reaction is arguably a greater achievement than the fusion itself. But it's just glossed over as if it's some patently obvious thing he had to do along the way. 
Every Harry Potter, the time turner would solve everything. Maybe different in the play, but in Rent they have no power, water, or heat, yet somehow have a working answering machine and phone line. I'd say the biggest plot hole, and one of the most well known plot holes, is Indiana Jones riding the top of a submarine across the sea. I mean I guess it would work if the boats didn't submerge, or if one of the Nazis left a hatch unlocked. In Night at the Museum, they can make the exhibit not come alive by turning that tablet, so why do they spend every single night running to do all that locking of cages and fleeing T-Rex, dog creatures, just turn the crap off, lock the cages, turn it back and enjoy, or better, just turn the dang tablet and have a normal relaxing day. What movie scene was super exaggerated or wrong based on your own knowledge? Any scene where a police team show up onto a crime scene and just start touching crap. I can feel the anger of the forensic teams walking around them who had to spend ages putting on all the gear and are sweating their balls off while some dickwood comes and contaminates their crime scene. I promise that if someone came and just started touching things IRL they would probably become the murder victim courtesy of the forensic team. Sticks finger into pile of mysterious powder and licks it yup, that's coke, may oaked foe of here. Every grenade explosion in every movie I've ever seen, it's always portrayed as a giant fireball. The reality is that grenades, while lethal, are not that impressive visually. Yep, just concussion and shrapnel. In the fourth or fifth Fast and Furious movie can't remember Vin Diesel is working on a car and rolls out from underneath holding a SB Chevy water pump. After 20 years as a mechanic, I have never removed that style water pump from underneath. That would be like the dentist checking your teeth through your butthole. I hope to never see my teeth from my butthole. Any scene that takes place in San Francisco or New York City where a character pulls up their car and parks right in front of their apartment building. Or a high speed chase in LA or any other big city. So I'm a hairdresser, and every time someone in a movie cuts their own hair with a knife or kitchen scissors without a mirror, then reappears in the next scene with a decent haircut, I die a little inside. My wife pointed that out in a movie recently, she complained their hair looks too good after chopping it off. House, no way are 13, foreman and the rest A, taking care of a single patient, B, drawing labs, handling meds, nursing, performing colonoscopies, general surgery, brain surgery, neurosurgery, or valve replacements, cardiothoracic surgery, c, breaking into houses, or d, not getting fired for blatant malpractice. It's like wish fulfillment for anyone who has been screwed around by the medical system. Doctors like that don't exist. I wish they did or I might have a diagnosis by now. There was a scene in I think the third Transformers movie with Shia LaBeouf working in the mail room of an office, like it's elaborated on that he's the bottom rung of the company, but then a Decepticon attacks and he runs through the building and into the data hall server room. I was working in an office with a data hall at the time and was furious. Data hall is the most secure location in the entire building. You can't just run into it, and some mail room pleb wouldn't have access even if you could. Last time I worked in a large organization like that you couldn't even go into the mail room without clearance. Any movie ever where two characters break off from the group, walk two steps away, have a separate conversation, and then rejoin the group as if everyone else couldn't have heard them talking. They were right there. The way diabetes, specifically type 1, is depicted in any film. Connor had me furious and don't get me started on panic room. For clarification, high blood sugar is rarely, pretty much never, a medical emergency. A low blood sugar is definitely a medical emergency but you don't want to give them their insulin. If you give them insulin when they are low, you've just killed them. I am petrified of what might happen if I'm hypoglycemic in public because so many people get this wrong and movies like these play a huge part in that. Also when they are low and do actually eat something. But it's either some slow acting cub or barely anything. I need to see the stumble walk to the fridge and subsequent feast that actually happens. The bits of cryptography and computer science that made it into the imitation game were all nonsense. They confuse a very special purpose machine with a general purpose computer. 
He attempts to go from nothing to fully functional machine without a simpler proof of concept machine, i.e., one attacking a code machine with dramatically fewer parts. His machine has no possible means of functioning, because they don't come up with the idea of using a crib until late in the movie. So what was the machine looking for? Nobody seems to have any idea how long the machine will take to do anything. They don't demonstrate test it against known codes. The manual code breakers give up at midnight and start again with new codes the next day. That's nonsense. They knew they had little hope of cracking a code in a day. So they would be focused on developing their algorithm against a static set of codes. Likely ones with known clear texts. But nothing about their effort made any sense. After the movie, I went and read some of the actual story, and yeah, the movie is completely disconnected from reality. Also, don't forget the fact that Turing didn't break Enigma. Polish cryptonalists did. He just industrialized their process. He was a genius. He did a lot for computer science. But he never broke Enigma. Silence isn't nearly as quiet as most movies make them seem. The bang will still be loud, just not deaf on everyone standing nearby loud. Movies make it seem like you can sneak around a base picking people off and nobody will notice. Anytime someone comes back to life and is immediately conscious and awake and like omg you saved my life thank you that's right I am looking at you medical shows. As an EMT of 5 years and worked in the emergency room that never happens. There is no quick wake up like nothing ever happened. It may take days or weeks for a revived person to regain consciousness. Or they may never. Your brain has been without oxygen for who knows how long. That causes major damage. Most medical TV shows are awful drams, except Scrubs. I heard once that Scrubs was actually one of the most factual medical series ever aired on television. I need to go watch that series again. Almost all war movies where a shell goes off within 10 feet of someone and it throws them around and they continue running. I'm looking at you Tom Cruise. Their organs would be liquefied. And bits of shrapnel would finish the job. It's called plot armor. Niku Nurse here. So basically most delivery and infant scenes. So many of them are completely misleading. My girlfriend was watching some show last night and I heard. Two placentas means two different fathers. No. No. It absolutely does not. When your water breaks I roll it basically just mean you're currently in labor. When your water breaks on TV it means the baby is actively being born. I'm a graphic designer, so anytime I see typography in historical shows or movies that's off, I notice it right away. Recently, I watched Bridgerton on Netflix and on Lady Whistledown's society papers. They use a footmark instead of an apostrophe in the kerning. Space between letters is loose enough to drive a car through. But no self-respecting typesetter in Regency area London would have printed something so shoddy. Get it together, Shonda. The travel scene in San Andreas, with Iraq. I love him as an actor, I love apocalyptic movies, but I regularly travel from LA to the Bay Area. No way do you get there that fast. No freaking way, even if you get a magical helicopter and or boat. Just no. On the TV show 24 where each episode was supposedly 1 hour in real time, Jack Bauer at one point got clear across LA in 20 or so minutes. For people who don't live out there, offering to drive someone to LAX is a sign of true friendship. It is killing most of their day. The Hunger Games was filmed in my neck of the woods. The white flowers Katniss puts around Rue's body are queen and lace. But locals call it chigger weed because little bugs that can crawl into your skin and itch like crazy like to live on them. The amount of stuff I'm learning in this thread on movies is awesome. Also, chiggers are awful and will meet mosquitoes in heck. In Aquaman, when there are two lines of people lined up against each other, underwater, one side is on sharks, the other on those giant seahorses, they have the animals growling at each other, none of those animals have lungs or vocal cords, they have gills, the most they could do is fart loudly if they were extra gassy. Someone needs to edit the scene, remove the growls, and add a couple loud fart noises. The scene in Mary Queen of Scots when Mary and Elizabeth meet, they never met, and from what I've read Elizabeth didn't feel all that sorry for Mary. Mary was also with the Queen of Scots, but she moved to France when she was 5 and it was her most fluent language, so would have had a French accent most likely. TV show, 
Glee. I'm a retired HS choral director. There is no way you put complex music like that together in one hour. Nope. Not happening. I've taught their arrangements to my choirs, and it takes all dang semester to get them ready. As a member of several bands, the fact that they often decide on the spot the song that they're going to play in the band just starts upsets off my nerves. We need music, whether it's full blown sheet music or just lead sheets, but definitely something. As a therapist it's funny how productions try to represent what a therapy session is like. No two therapists or patients are the same so maybe some therapists practice like the movies but the ethical boundaries or just frowned upon things therapists say and do on screen are silly. I was looking for this comment. The way therapists are portrayed in nearly every movie is laughable. Anytime anyone does CPR, I was a boy scout, I took CPR classes, etc. If you're doing it right, you're using your whole body, with enough force to break a rib. I understand why actors don't want to do that, but I seen them with bent elbows, and it just breaks any immersion I have instantly. The issue is that people see that and think that's what CPR is supposed to be like. Then when the real deal happens to them they sue because they think the person was unnecessarily forceful. Not strictly a movie, but a TV show, for the life of me. I cannot figure out what job, s, the guys had on the Big Bang Theory. 1. They clearly aren't graduate students, as they've all got PhDs, except for Wallowitz. 2. They're not tenure track faculty as there was an episode where they all fought for the open tenure position, which they wouldn't be in competition for unless they didn't have that job already. 3. They never really met the definition of a postdoc as that would be under the supervision of a tenure track faculty member. And they never mentioned having a boss other than the president of the university who was way more invested in what they were doing than he should be. Note below. Also, postdocs are temporary positions, so they should have been looking for a real job from day one of the show. There's too much long term stability in that position. 4. They don't seem to have any sort of faculty position at all, as, except for one episode, there was no mention of teaching responsibilities. They are 100% researchers, with zero expected teaching responsibility and nobody ever mentioned committee work, which is a shame, because you know Sheldon would be on every possible committee he could and then you'd have episodes where everybody else had to be on a committee with him. They supposedly had advisors on the show that made sure the science was correct, but the whole academic culture involved is just wrong. Note, the president shouldn't be involved in specific research projects ever. They shouldn't have to run ideas past him for approval. And he doesn't hold the purse strings for funding. Just, OMG. Freaking no. ETA.4. Anything that's ever involved banking. Working in the industry for 5 minutes you know 99% of any kind of theft or fraud or anything is entirely bulls. The one that really bummed me out was that it killed that Futurama episode for me where he woke up with billions of dollars in interest. No dice fry. That money goes to the new New York State Treasury. While he probably would have been ruled dead in absentia and his savings sent to probate. The interesting thing about that episode is that they do calculate the interest accurately. My cousin Vinny, when Marissa Tomei is called as a surprise expert witness. Ironically the movie is so accurate for other legal matters it's almost mandatory to watch a few scenes in every US law school and even more ironic is that the scene in particular is prized as an example of how to establish a witness as an expert. A third level of irony is Tomei explains earlier to Passy how discovery works. No surprises. But no way in an IRL murder trial is a lawyer's girlfriend suddenly allowed to testify as an expert witness. Still though what a fantastic movie. In movies with navy submarines sometimes they make it seem like they go for a 24 degree angle in 2 seconds and everyone goes flying. That's not how it works. Is more of a 10-15 degree angle over a shorter time and everyone just gets used to the new angle. Anything involving casinos or gambling. I worked as a croupier for a long asset time and every TV or movie portrayal of a casino or card game is laughably bad. Casino Royale still kills me. Straight flush over full house over full house over flush. GTFOH. Also any time they try to call a bet by throwing their keys in the pot. Or say I see your bet. And I raise you. Crocodile Dundee. Every. Freaking. American. 
thinks we say shrimp on the barbie. Nobody says that. We don't call them shrimp either, it's prawns. Prawns. Also not everyone has the rich thick bogan Australian accent. Disney Channel Bully Scenes. I was bullied a lot and even I know that very few people are ever that outright rude mean sarcastic. Kids are passive aggressive with their bullying. And even when they're loud about it they aren't whatever major losers ed snap about it. In reality, every movie's bully would definitely be bullied in real life. Anytime a horse appears on screen, I start cringing about all the bad horsemanship and inaccurate attack and actually dangerous things that are on the horizon. I really try not to think about it, but after 30 plus years working with horses and 40 plus years being totally into history, I get confused when I see Frisians in weird places. Gets off horse. Leaves horse with all tack on in woods and walks away. Comes back 10 minutes later and horse hasn't moved or stepped on reins. Almost any chase scene with a cargo truck tractor trailer involves some really ridiculous errors in how those vehicles function. Most recently I rewatched Casino Royale and the fuel truck at the airport scene almost had me screaming at the TV. Doctor Strange. Stephen Strange gets in a car accident and the crash causes the dashboard to roll back and crush his hands, which is kinda the catalyst for the rest of the movie, but it wouldn't happen like that. Steven is driving a luxury racing car, when you're in one of those you're basically in a tub sitting in a really strong frame, it doesn't crash like that. And also, that road he's on way more traffic, it would not take a few hours to find him. Source, I watched Doctor Strange with a firefighter. Yeah also those super sports cars have a crap ton of airbags that would have saved him. And I don't mean the classic frontal airbag. They also have sideways airbags. Any period piece where the clothes are too freaking modern? Why the heck are these women not wearing chemises? As someone WHO has worn a corset. For the sakes of period accuracy. They are super uncomfortable without them not saying they're uncomfortable in general. Just saying it's like some of the whalebone sticks through. Also, depending on who is wearing the corset matters, you would definitely not be seeing some random peasant woman wearing a corset with no chemise, even noble women would wear them for the sake of an underlayer. Well of course Independence Day when Jeff Goldblum Wireless connects his Mac laptop to the alien mothership and infects it with a virus. There was a scene cut from the movie that explained that all of Earth's computing technology was developed from reverse engineering the alien ship that crashed. All these CSI type shows, the guys are like leave the lights off. I need to experience the scene like the killer did it is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. If you on your hands and knees looking for loose hairs do you want complete darkness? Dang. I've been collecting samples in the dark for 8 hours. I think I have enough to catch the killer. Ha. Huh. We caught him 4 hours ago. He dropped his wallet in the hallway. Turn on a freaking light and you would have noticed. This will probably get buried. But oh well, in snakes on a plane, I know, famed for so much realism, what bothered me wasn't any of the obvious things. Things like, you know, snakes crawling up out of the septic into the toilet to bite a man square on the brown eye. It wasn't the fact that Samuel L. Jackson actually agreed to do such a ridiculous thing. No, it wasn't even the entire, stupendously unbelievable premise that bothered me. What bothered me is that somehow, in a 747, an admittedly large aircraft, there were freaking miles of crawl spaces. That's not how IT freaking works. Every tiny bit of space is about utility on those suckers. They don't go around saying, ah, yes, and here we'll have a foyer with potentially vital controls, unconnected to any reasonable way to access it, because we have these freaking miles of tight, belly crawling passages. Gee, Bill, don't you think maybe we could add extra cargo space or passenger seating by taking out just some of the tunnels? Frick em, I finalized the designs already, and I like crawl spaces. The Shermans having to get close to the Tiger 1 in fury to penetrate the armor even though the 75mm cannon on 3 of the Shermans and the 76mm on the fury would have had no problem in destroying that Tiger from that short distance. Possibly worse than that was the German soldiers running at the front of the stranded tank. You know, where the Bow and Koch's machine guns are pointing. Again and again. Instead of, I don't know, approaching from the side, flanking, 
It's something even Hitler Youth know about. Either your suggestion or mine. This movie was the first thing that came to mind when I saw the title. Every American high school where the bell rings and the teacher tells them what to do for homework while they're walking out. Idiot. Every American high school where the teacher seems to have only one class over and over with the same kids in it. Every American high school where the teacher is a complete butthole who takes delight in making their students feel like crap. I mean, I know those people are out there, but this is so far from what 99.9% .9 of teachers do on a regular basis. We work so hard not to make kids feel like crap because the rest of the world is doing it to them all the time already. Backdraft with Kurt Russell. Just let me say in my 20 plus years of fight fighting I have never seen so little smoke inside a burning building. Usually you can't see Jack, and are crawling around looking for actual flames. It's not purposefully wrong or a mistake because it was based on the historically accepted version of events when the film was made but, Cameron's depiction of Titanic's breakup is most likely a little exaggerated and some of it we now know to be wrong. Not Cameron's fault. What he shot was what we thought happened. It's only in the last decade that we've realized Titanic's breakup probably happened a different way. I'm 100% sure the propeller guy actually happened that way though. It's likely to have been mentioned already but Braveheart is quite historically inaccurate. One example of many is the fact that by that point in time the Scots were wearing armor. Not kilts as depicted for dramatic effect. The Book of Eli. Spoiler. The story is about a blind man traveling with a braille version of the King James Bible. The book that he carries is pretty thick but it's nowhere near as big as the entire Bible would be in braille. A full King James Bible in braille would be around 6 foot tall. However, if you look over that detail, it still is a good movie. The dang scene in Jurassic World where he is clicker training the raptors. There is so much wrong with it that it actually makes me mad watching it. Blue click 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 easy click 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 click. Jeebus not how clicker training works you ignorant are. It's like they consulted with someone about what tools an animal trainer might have, but they didn't bother to learn anything about how the tools get used. Or maybe they did see examples of clicker training in practice, but they decided it didn't look exciting enough on screen. Although I haven't seen it in a while so I can't confirm this 100%. I am pretty sure that the last poker scene in Casino Royal, with the black dude, and the Asian guy, would never happen at a poker table. They could have got an actual poker dealer there, or at least someone with a general idea. Not to mention one of them goes all on on two pair, with a potential straight flush on the board. Homie what is you doing? It is an incredibly bad poker scene, but I'm pretty the dude was actually a poker dealer from what I've read on the movie. I guess there's only so much you can when they tell you to just follow the script. Same with Bond tipping him a chip in a tournament and not a cash game at the end when that would have no actual value. Not a specific movie, but any time a normal person is driving a normal car, and the tires screech whenever they stop or first start. I mean sure that happens when somebody is making a speedy getaway or something. But I doubt Betty in her Toyota Camry is going to come to a reaching stop in driveway on her way home from work. I don't know how many times I have seen in movies car tires squealing under acceleration, on gravel. Anytime someone does drugs and they try to show what it's like. I thought Midsommar did a solid job with mushrooms. What was a time when you used a sex move you saw in a porno in real life and it ended horribly? My husband is really into stripper pee. I tried to recreate a move where the man was sitting in a chair and the stripper does a handstand. Fies resting on the guy's shoulders. Her cooch in his face. Then she twerks. Almost like a seated 69. Lighting and music are perfect. I ask him to sit down. Do a little floor show. Then I pull out my big move. Execute it perfectly except as begin to twerk I'll let out the loudest queef right in his face. Still way better than 99% of the rest of the mishaps in this topic. First time I came in a girl's mouth she spit it out in her hand and threw it at me in surprise. It was her first time giving a BJ. Ah she spiderm in your butt. Do not frick a girl up against the glass wall in the shower. Especially not in a rented apartment. That wall is expensive. My GF at the time was giving me a BJ while I was standing up and I thought I'd return the favor by picking her up and spinning her upside down for a standing 69. 
She got freaked out about being picked up. Farted which made me gag and I ended up giving her a tombstone in the living room of my first apartment. She kinked her neck and hit her foot on the edge of my coffee table while the forward momentum of the drop caused me to slowly fall on top of her bending my dong on her stomach. That emergency room visit wasn't a fun one and the doc couldn't stifle his laughter during our explanation. This is like the fifth wrestling reference I've seen in this thread. I like it. Undertaker would be proud. I was on a Tinder date at the time. On top of this guy. He thought it'd be super hot if he grabbed my hips and slid me to sitting on his face. Too bad that we had too much momentum going. I ended up hitting my nose on the backboard of my headboard so hard that it broke. Hot in theory though. Decided to give daring outside sex a go. Drove down a country road and pulled over. Started going at it with my butt hanging off the hood of the car. We hear a car approaching and my partner panics and drops me on my butt. Flat on my bare butt in the dirt as a car comes along while he stands there all nonchalant. Thanks honey. You never really know someone until you find out how they react when you get caught dogging. I thought I'd try DP. But then the one guy started sucking the other guy's dong so it never happened. I won't be exploring that any further. Well that ended up a disappointment. I'm 4'11 and my husband is 6'2". We tried to frick standing up leaning on nothing in particular when he hoisted me into the air and then lost his grip. The man dropped me to the floor like a sack of potatoes. Your username for some reason makes this 10x funnier. I was once trying to do some rough play with my current so. Things heated up in the living room and escalated to me picking her up and carrying her to my bedroom. Once there, in an attempt to manhandle her and show off strength, I chunked her onto the bed like a brute which banged the frick out of her tailbone and resulted in her crying for 10 minutes. The sex did not continue. Just as a tip, doing the pile driver is actually kind of hard and uncomfortable. Don't do it unless you have good lower body strength. Instructions unclear. Put girlfriend through the Spanish announce table. We were on the bed and I tried to pick her up and frick her against the wall, while standing on the bed. I didn't know her bed was on wheels. Bed slides out and we go into the gap. My forehead breaks her nose and splits her lip. I put my thumb in a girl's mouth cause I saw doctor. Manhattan do it. My finger is not like kissing a battery, and I don't have bangin' blue muscles. Was a mistake. I hooked up with a nice girl after meeting at a party. The first time we did everything short of anal. We were drunk. Don't worry it was clearly consensual. It was fun. And I remember saying you're like my own personal pornster and she loved that. A few weeks in. We were at it again and she said you can do anything you want. I thought quickly about how all the P I'd seen recently had lots of butt eating and so I made an attempt. I guess she had done a number 2. And there was for sure a bit of that flavor. I thought that was normal, and I powered on. She seemed to be into it, but kept clenching her cheeks. At one point I was licking the booty hole and rubbing the clit and I felt like a champ. Then this happened quickly, and we spoke about it many times after but this is my memory. She says wait stop 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 and I pull up and say what's wrong and then the nastiest fart I've ever heard came out of her rear end. I almost passed out threw up. We didn't ever try that again. But I saw her at a party maybe 7 months ago and she was drunk and said remember that time. So I guess it wasn't that embarrassing. At least she told you to stop. An advance heads up. She didn't have to say anything and you could've ended up with a mouthful of butt air. I was a virgin making out with a girl in bed one night. I didn't know how to ask if she wanted to have sex. So I asked one a root. She pee herself laughing and she made me wait another month to finally lose my virginity. The Australian has been spotted. I repeat. The Australian has been spotted. Was getting sexy against a wall and tried to pick her up by grabbing the back of her thighs and lifting. She just slid down the wall and landed bare butt on the floor. One of my smoother moves. Smoothest sex to oral transition ever. Ex-girlfriend thought it would be hot to hit me during sex. I was standing by the side of the bed and had her face up laying down on the bed. Then she proceeds to give me the most fierce backhand I've ever received right to the cheek. Instant boner killer. And my face was redder than the devil's dong for about an hour. 
I asked my wife to call me Papi Poppy during sex and forgot about the request. A few days later she yelled out OHH Papi. I stopped my fantastic moves and looked her in the eye and said who the heck is Bobby. That boy ain't right. Not me but my roommate. He and his girlfriend tried something while standing up. Heard a primal scream. She runs out naked screaming for us to help. Ran in and his dong was broken. I cannot explain what I saw. A penis pointing entirely in the wrong direction looking blue and red. He was in agony but could not touch it. We called ambulance. It was pretty serious we heard later. He had to stay in the hospital a couple days. To this day we don't know what they were trying. Not seen in a porno, but in a chat room while I was in college, I was talking to a woman online. She was going on and on about how her husband used to haul cough drop on her while going down on her and she loved it. So I tried it on my girlfriend, now wife. It's been almost 20 years, and the image of her holding her crotch, jumping around and yelling at Burns. IT Burns remains seared in my memory. You got trolled sir. I was trying to blow a load like Peter North. I was going for distance, so I pulled out and looked down to enjoy, first hand, the glazing I was about to put spray across my partner, I came in my own eye, you must have a red rider BB gun, cause you shot your eye out. When I was a teenager, the guy kept sticking his finger in me then into my mouth, it was annoying and I asked him to stop multiple times, he wouldn't so I figured I would do this thing I saw on Winamp porno stream, I snowballed him. He really wasn't about that life, ended up vomiting off the side of the bed. He never did the finger thing again and we broke up a few months after. I love how you gave him a taste of his own medicine. I once used a numbing condom without realizing it. She finished and I wasn't even close freaking weird. She removed the condom and started sucking me off. After a couple minutes she attempted to articulate that her mouth was fearing funny. We checked the box and laughed for days. I'm giving you gold for fearing funny I've had crap evening and that made me laugh unnecessarily hard. My ex-boyfriend was going down on me for the first time and all of a sudden his head jerked up and his face was covered in blood. I freaked out thinking I started my period 3 weeks early. Turns out he got a bloody nose. He was very embarrassed but I thought it was the funniest thing ever. I think it was trying to have upside down rough sex. Then accidentally knocking out the person freaking me. For the first 3 minutes I thought I killed him. Fun times. My girlfriend at the time jumped at me while I was standing. But physics didn't agree with the movement and I wasn't braced well. Instead of catching her and proceeding to bang her like James Dean. I lost my balance and started falling forward. She ends up planting her feet. Back pedaling off balance for 3 or 4 steps into a small rolling nightstand with a lava lamp sitting atop it. The lava lamp falls and shatters. Of course she ends up bare acid and the resulting lava, water, glass shard mixture. I ended up removing glass shards from her butt cheeks for the next 20 minutes. Yeah, but you got to stare at a girl's butt for 20 minutes, so. My, now, wife and I had set up a webcam. This was before smartphones and were watching ourselves on our TV while filming ourselves. She was riding me reverse cowboy, and I was like frick, this is super hot. So out of the blue I started slapping her clit with the tips of my fingers from behind her. Hadn't ever thought of doing it before, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. What could go wrong? Well, wouldn't you know, she shriveled up like a tulip in a drought. Turns out having your clit slapped isn't always the most pleasurable experience. What's the worst that could happen? Well I don't know, but the blue balls I got after we had to stop from her first freaking out, then us both laughing uncontrollably about it, have both worked to prevent me from attempting that particular maneuver since. Had her do reverse cowgirl and thrusted like crazy, I was going too fast and slipped out, punching straight into her anus. She screamed bloody murder and dragged her butt across the floor like a dog. It took her a full week to recover. We're still together and will be going on 5 years after this month. Stuck my finger in his butt and he farted. I laughed. He went limp and kicked me out while avoiding further eye contact. You triggered his self defense mechanism. Throat fricking. Where she was laying on her back and I was thrusting down her throat. Lots of puking. Very little fun. This is kind of a 2 for 1. 
I met this older girl who had just gotten out of high school. Flashback to 14 years old. She was pretty direct in saying she wanted to have sex with me. At the time I was a virgin and I was naturally excited so on random Saturday afternoon we met up at the mall. I told her how hot it would be to have sex in public but I didn't have any ideas as to where. She told me we can just go in the private family bathroom and I was all for it. We went in and got naked. Obviously. She started off with a BJ. But 14 years me couldn't take the waiting anymore so I laid her down on the diaper changing station. Which was marble or something. Not that flimsy ones you would usually see. I decide to rub my dong on her vag and just ram it all in there to take her hardcores that was the kinda crap I watched in pee. Well. It didn't really work out the way I planned. I shove it all in there and not even 2 seconds later. Like Tifu story. I came harder than I ever have right in there. I immediately let out a loud moan which I swear echoed followed by deep fear for obvious reasons. We get dressed and start to walk out only to find three families with children waiting right outside the door. But needless to say I was embarrassed to all heck that my first time was ruined by my need to frick like a pornster. TL. DR. I lasted literally 2 seconds while losing my virginity in a mall public bathroom while children heard me CM because I wanted my first time to be like the pornos. But did you at least use a condom? At a party. Super wasted. Hooked up with an equally wasted girl with a bunch of tattoos and piercings. It's not usually my type, but whatever. Get her back to mine and she's super enthusiastic blowing me. It was awesome. And she kept saying. Frick my mouth. It seemed weird to me. BJ etiquette as far as I was aware was to stay mostly still and massage her hair and scalp. Whatever. I went at it like an any deep throat porno. So I'm fricking her face and getting more used to it and harder and more forceful. It felt so weird to me. But she said she was totally into it. I carried on. Until all of a sudden. Mid thrust. She gags and retches. She panics and pulls her head away. And her tongue piercing got caught on my. A banjo string. There was like no room for me to move to go with it and it just ripped. So. She promptly throws up all over my sheets. While my dong is literally squirting blood all over the place. Like. With every heartbeat there was a full spurt of blood coming out. She got embarrassed and ran to the bathroom to get cleaned up. So I was stood in my kitchen bollock naked holding kitchen roll on my dong. We spent the night sort of cuddling on my couch. Tending to my bleeding dong and trying to laugh about it. She left in the morning and I spent the entire next day just tending to it. The day after that, when showering, I peeled back the foreskin to have a look and it started spurting blood again so I went to the doctor. They cleaned it up a bit and told me I could either just wait, clean it daily, and wait 6 weeks without masturbating or having sex so it could heal. Or I could get circumcised. I opted for the former, then had sex 6 weeks after to the day. Midway through, I notice myself getting soft. I pull out to see what's going on with little Jesus, and it's torn again and filling my condom up with blood. I left it like 10 weeks after that time before banging again. I read in Cosmo that using pop rocks during a BJ was exciting. I told my friend who I was visiting and when we were at the store she picked some up because it just seemed like a good idea at the time. I was sleeping across from the bathroom and in the middle of the night I heard her husband barreling to the bathroom yelling if try again 420 said she read that putting sand in your mouth would feel good would you listen. The next morning, over breakfast, he thanked me for suggesting his wife turn her tongue into a piece of sandpaper before going down on him but politely asked I leave my sex tips to myself in the future. I exclusively jerk off with 40 grit sandpaper so I'm not understanding the issue here. I was like 21 years old and I had slept with a girl I had been seeing. I had no clue she lived with her parents. And I vaguely remember her saying she had to go to work and that I had to leave before 11am but I just drifted off asleep. I was lying down naked on the couch, and the girl's mom comes home and sees me sleeping nude on the couch. She freaked out a bit and asked me who I was and what the heck I was doing in her home. I told her I was her daughter's friend, and I noticed that she looked at my dong up and down. I really have no clue what came over me, but I just said so, you like what you see? Right away I thought to myself, what is wrong with you? The mother just started laughing, and asked if I wanted coffee. I was really surprised, but she seemed oddly comfortable. We drank coffee and talked about George Bush while I was butt naked on her couch for like 10 minutes. 
She had a lovely Dutch accent and made kind of strange comments about my body you have the same type of chest hair my husband had. Don't feel weird, I've seen it all honey. How does someone your age even get that hairy you look like a man? The mom was really cool. I had dinner with them a few times and she was just a super hip, awesome lady. Respect the heck out of her. You look like a man. Learned to rub my girlfriend's clit while she rode me ended up squirting on her roommate's suede futon in their dorm. Was a dark spot on it till the day we threw it out. Tried to spice things up by going at it on the hood of my car in the middle of a cornfield during a rainstorm. Tried a movie bit I'd seen. The old ripping off of the panties. Well, let's just say those particular underoos might as well have been made of titanium. Not only did I not tear them even in the slightest, but in my haste and frisky frustration I pulled on the panties hard enough to pull her off the car. She ended up falling into a puddle and getting a broken corn stalk jammed into her thigh. So, in the end, I got her all wet and screaming. Just not in the way we intended. Guy wanted to lick peanut butter off my nipples and I was like okay sure it was a little strange but it was something new to try so why not. In college my ex was riding me sitting with her legs wrapped around me. I picked her up and pushed her up against the wall and put her halfway through the flimsy drywall back first. We finished though because I ain't no quitter. I don't think that defines us ended horribly. Honestly it's a conversation starter. I hooked up with a stripper while I was in college. We played a game where I would grab some food and do something sexy with it. She was blindfolded and would have to guess what the food was. Since I was in college, I didn't have much in the pantry, so I grabbed a pickle and fricked her with it. She orgasmed and then when she took her blindfold off and found out it was a pickle, she freaked out. Something about fricking her with a half sour kosher pickle grossed her out. The idea of brine in my vagina is kinda disconcerting. I have to say, I'm not sure why. 2008. Had a girlfriend who was much younger than me. One day she was going down on me when I suggested that we try 69. She's never heard of 69 before. I had to stop her from what she was doing, explain to her what it was, and after seeing her horrified reaction, she almost started crying. She was so upset, I not just gave up on the idea. But she became really reticent to have sex with me much more after that, as she wasn't into kinky sex. Then she discovered Twilight and we stopped being physical altogether. Then we broke up. Before I suggested 69, she was all over me. As soon as I suggested it, it was like I told her that I'd kill her family if she touched my penis ever again. Hopefully she has had a few more years to live and experience things and still doesn't view 69 as kinky. It isn't. I mean, there's 69 in P, but it's not like I was asking her to do a bareback anal gangbang or anything. First time I came on a girl's face it got really awkward really quick. Turns out the cleanup stage isn't nearly as cool as the act of doing it. Cold water is key. Boyfriend and I got sexual in the kitchen, and he boinked me while I was sitting on the edge of the countertop. I've been dealing with a lower spine injury for two years now. Sad day for creative freaking. An ex saw P where the girl grabbed the guy's dong with both hands and twisted her hands in opposite directions. She failed to notice that said dong was lubricated. My husband tried this thing the other day where he'd frick me and then stop. He just went totally still and stopped everything. I thought he had a seizure. Then he started again like nothing happened. It happens again twice and I'm like what the frick man. He called it buffering. Terrible. Haha. <laughs> or the 90s version. Stripping down. Hiding behind a large curtain. Then lowering the curtain starting at your head and moving about one stroke to an inch a second until starting back over with a different pose 5 minutes later. Posted before but relevant. This was years ago. Fresh out of high school. I had recently broken up with my high school sweetheart and was finally on the rebound. Met a girl I wasn't super into. But she was attractive enough. Really into me. And I needed to get laid. So one night things are getting pretty heavy in my bed and she moans in my ear telling me to frick her. Mission accomplished. So now I reach in my nightstand drawer for a condom when she says she's on the pill so I don't need it as long as I pull out. This was a new experience for me so with great vigor I strip off both our clothes and go to town. It felt amazing and I was showing her the time of her life. 
Finally the time comes when I need to and I pull out a strong grip on my dong to prevent any spillage. Now this is where it gets weird. Prior to this, I had only had boring protected sex with my ex. No BJs or anything fun or kinky. This was a first. And with all my sexual knowledge stemming from an abundance of pee consumption, I sprayed that load the only place that made sense. Her face. And believe me, that dry spell between my ex and her gave me quite a large load to deliver. I'll never forget that look of shock and horror and the screaming as I frosted her lips, nose, cheeks, hair, and eyes with a powerful velocity. Before I could stroke out the last of it she pushed me aside and staggered around my room like Helen Keller on fire, feeling for anything that she could use to wipe her face off. It didn't take her long to concede and collapse on the floor crying hysterically, snot and cm and tears dripping from her face as I sat there dumbfounded, still not realizing what had just happened. And then, as a result of all the commotion and frantic crying, my mom opens the door. TL. Doctor. Snot and CM and tears. TL. Doctor. Snot and CM and tears and mom. Fix that for your buddy. Sex while high on marijuana count. Saw it online and thought why not. We are about to have sex. My knees locked on his shoulders in missionary. I'm flexible. We're pressed together in a jackhammerish position idk what it's called. Making out heavily. Then I fart. I laugh. Then he laughs. My laughs keep pushing out more farts in time with the laughs and we just keep laughing and he loses his boner because we were just so high. <laughs> Reverse cowgirl with the girl laying back on top of you. So both of you are facing up. It would have been fine except. Girls with really big booty can't really lay their back flat on your chest and expect you to stay inside. Thankfully it slipped out instead of broke off. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. for now.